We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry and I'm here with Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions uh, answered. And uh, we saw back. We missed a week. Yeah. Very, very week. unusual for us, uh, but we are human. It was bound to happen at some point, and uh, yeah, yeah. There'll, there'll be plenty of references to it throughout the episode, no oh, doubt. Oh, will there be? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was my birthday on the last day it we were supposed was. to... Yeah, and I didn't get a single happy birthday message from any of my listeners, so <laughs> that's why we canceled the podcast. Okay. And that's what you get for being ungrateful, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that is entirely made up on the spot. Uh so I've been thinking about it nonstop. How was that made up on the spot? <laughs> this is all I've been thinking about. It really was not the reason. Little I am appreciated. <laughs> really was not the reason we missed last week. But... I told Rob I'm not doing this podcast, but I don't get. It, and I'm gonna get at least one birthday wish. I got zero. Uh, zero yeah. birthday wishes. I think. I don't know. I might have gotten some. I wasn't paying attention. Your face froze on a fantastic frame rate as you said that too. So it all lines up. It's definitely AV rant back in the old swing of things. We gotta get a better system than the Skype. Thing. <laughs> Skype sucks. I don't think it's we Skype's. Got... Well, I mean, I'm hardwired. I've got no problem streaming. I got good uploads, good downloads. There's no reason. Yeah, it's the USB cable on your camera. That's the issue. Oh, I don't think that's the issue. That's entirely the issue. Or the USB port on your laptop. I don't, it's one of those two I, it's, things. It's not the port on the laptop. It, it's uh, it could be the cable. It's I mean, definitely I'm just the, the USB cable on your camera. Then. Oh, uh, geez, you've been frozen a while. It's going to switch cameras. Oh, there, there it go. goes. Switch. Look at that. How did I, I know? Might. It's almost as and though back. past hey, experience is a pretty good indicator of future things that'll happen in some instances. I know. Yeah. All right. Enough of that. Save Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Hey, Mike. <laughs> well, it's going back and forth on camera. Yeah. Now. That's what's happening. I've switched got, it well, over to the, the thing so they can see where to email us. So you can freeze as much right. as you want for the moment. All right, let me just see where this cam- this other camera is at. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, your head's cut off. No one bit. can see it right now. But that's because the place to send your questions right. is question at avrant.com. That's our email right. address. That's the place to send your questions. It's really the place we want you to send the questions, so we'll, yeah. we'll mention that's our best contact place. Question at avrant.com. Yeah. Email. You can also find us on uh, avrant.com, you, uh, facebook.com slash avrant, youtube.com slash AV Rant Podcast. No, no that was the way around. Facebook Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, YouTube.com slash AV Rant. That's it. Rob's email is Rob AV Rant. His Twitter is at uh, First Reflect. I'm Tom at AV Rant.com. My Twitter is at AV Rant underscore Tom. I want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you support this podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to AV Rant.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. And there it will take you to a PayPal donation site. So we want to thank Matt and Ben for doing that this week. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, Matt and Ben, thank you very much for the PayPal donations. Really appreciate that. And you know what? I just wanted to quickly mention here, it's uh, episode 775, so it's a nice round number. It almost feels like something where you could, you know, throw in a little message. And uh, yeah, just wanted to mention, like, um, you know, we've we've collected some new listeners, and, and every once in a while it's just good to remind people, like, we're not like one of those podcasts that makes money like we're not a you know sponsored and this is our job this is why and... we don't have <laughs> you don't hear life lock on here. right yeah exactly we don't have any ads rolling through or anything like that we have the the bare minimum number of ads that are required by youtube just for us to have a channel that can post videos that are longer than 10 minutes which ours definitely are um but yeah i mean like i know there's lots of people like on youtube and doing podcasts and uh some of them are you know doing it enough that that that's their livelihood uh, we're we're like we're just we're just two guys talking about home theater and we really enjoy it and it's a complete labor of love so when we talk about this financial stuff it's like that honestly that all started simply because sometimes people would send us a question they enjoyed our answer or they were just entertained by us and they're like is there a way we can just show our appreciation and that is where this comes from and what we're about to talk with patreon that that, that was like by request so please don't ever feel like uh this is like a financial venture for us because well not for me anyway who knows sending a birthday email is free though i'm just gonna let you guys know that that's true in case you're wondering (laughs) it's free to send a birthday email jerks Uh (laughs) my tripod is falling apart apparently like i I pulled it out of the side and like 
it's in two pieces. I now. did wish Tom a happy birthday, it's... but it was the day before, so I didn't even send him a message on his actual birthday. <sighs> then again, you said you were going to be like really busy and like you know. I so. was really Tuesdays are my yeah, busy day, exactly. and so, it was extra busy. So that I day wish before. you a happy birthday the day before. I uh, that still counts. That's all right. Yeah, we have 131 patrons over at Patreon.com. Wait. Patreon is a service that you, uh, you can become a subscriber to our podcast, where every month they take some money from you and give most of it to us. We have 131 patrons, including Carl. So thank you very much uh, to our 131 patrons, or 130 plus Carl. That's right. Patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. So very, uh, very nice to see 131 patrons over there. And Carl, thank you for being one of them. Yeah, we got uh, David sent in uh, some photos for me to use on AV Gadgets. Scott sent Rob a donation directly, I guess, and yep. a thank you note for some help via uh, their from their email conversation yeah. that I guess he helped them with. And we got some notes of gratitude from keeping the podcast going during this ongoing pandemic from Derek Jr. Nathan, who reminded us that Warner Brothers went back and forth on their plans, but seemed to have settled on Dune coming out day and date to HBO Max in theaters October 22nd. Also, not my birthday, which would have been a good thing to happen on because I'm a huge Dune fan. Between Dune coming out and the Foundation series yeah. becoming a thing, it's like... You're going to have to sign up for more subscriptions. I don't services. know how I'm going to convince my wife that we're going to spend all this money that we I mean, need to spend for me to watch these things. Apple but, TV Plus is only $5 a month, so you could do one month, $5, after all of Foundation is out, just binge through it. That's, that's really not too bad of a financial ask. HBO Max is more, though, so I don't know what you're going to do there. Yeah. I'm going to wait till it comes out on a disc, and if it's good, There's I'm going to buy it. Uh, Nathan, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Kurt, who thanked us for putting a show out every week until last week, mm -hmm. which is his his fault. If you, look at it, if you think of it this way, Jinxed if it. he hadn't mentioned it, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have not done it. We wouldn't have realized we'd have been so long without a break. Uh, and, he, and then he, he also mentions that since he's in Tampa, his offer to, to take me to lunch whenever uh, this pandemic is truly a thing of the past still stands. Nice. Br Brandon sent us a lovely note. He says, we're the unicorns of the home theater hobby because we're logical and biased and often suggest a less expensive way to do things. In most of his other hobbies, people jump on the newest idea as, if, as though last year's products had zero merit. Some home theater fans do that too. Not some. <laughs> to just be honest <laughs> nearly all i mean like why would you buy last year's you know speakers when there's a new one this year i mean other than the fact that they sound literally exactly this whatever uh but home theater is the only hobby where he comes across people who shun new information i don't think you're looking very hard actively try to keep information hidden I don't think you're looking very hard. Gatekeeping, condescending, and getting to flame wars where everybody involved is just shouting misinformation at each other. That could be any that's hobby, though. Really, that, yeah. really kind of. That really kind of. That's that's really sounds really familiar to me right now. <laughs> it's made him feel like he needs to leave all the AV forms, which Rob and I have done. <laughs> so he or says, like I lurk sometimes to try and glean information. <laughs> every once in a while, I go to Reddit and realize, wow, it's good like, you go there because I don't go to Reddit. So I just it's not. <laughs> He says, cheers to us at AV Rant. There's no way his system or and his love of this hobby would be as strong without us. And then we've got, I mean, this is this is hard to keep all these things straight. Billy Carl Matt, who says our podcast is his favorite source of learning about home theater. So this are thanks for keeping the podcast going. But That's first right. of all, let's go back. <laughs> David thanked us for, uh, gave us gave me permission to use his pictures on AV Gadget. Thank you, Scott, David. send Rob a donation. Thank you very much, Scott. And then we've got notes of gratitude from Derek, Jr., Nathan, Kurt, Brandon, B Billy, Carl, and Matt. That is right. I'll repeat the names once more so it came out of my mouth. Derek, Jr., Nathan, Kurt, Brandon, Billy, Carl, and Matt. Thank you all very much for those notes of gratitude and encouragement. Sorry, Kurt, that we, we messed it up just when you sent that in two weeks ago. Uh, and I did want to mention uh, these are not all the names of the past two weeks. These are the all the names and the thank yous and the listeners of the weeks from the episode that we missed last week and then uh, everything that came in on what would be this week i've got a separate list for those and we'll find a way to catch up if, if it's this week or next week or whatever it is so if you did not hear your name and you're like hey i did something last week uh you, you will get your mention it will be on the very next episode whatever that might be <laughs> right. okay uh what are we doing now news yeah, no. news N news okay lots of people pinged us about the yo yeah yo i mean they do just say yio and it is all capitalized so what? they just go by yio it stands for your input output yio remote 2 it's uh it's up on kickstarter uh mm -hmm. youtuber youthman 
had a live stream with the founders that we will fully admit we didn't find time to watch. I didn't Did know about it until like literally this. That's second. right. So there are lots more details in that uh, hour plus video. The design is an aluminum body within the rechargeable built-in battery and a color touch screen. With a similarly sparse number of hard buttons as the Sofa Baton X1 that we've been talking about recently. It comes with a charging dock that doubles as the IR hub and blaster along with one IR extender. The more upscale design means prices are a lot higher, 370 euro or about $425 US. And that's the Kickstarter pledge price. Mm -hmm. So who knows how much it'll be. But unlike the Sofa Baton X1, this YIO Remote 2, was there a one? I guess there was a one at some point. I don't know. That's that's just what they're calling it. I don't recall the YIO Remote 1, but this is the name. It's still in development, and even their own ambitious Kickstarter plans don't predict it will ship until July 2022, while they talk about home automation control and an open API and their ease of setup and configuration via web app. There's still a lot of we plan to phrases and a note that they believe that they're ready to begin manufacturing, but they need the crowdfunding to make it happen. So a true Kickstarter, unlike the Sofa Baton, which is just like. We just we are, we're basically using this as advertising and a sale and a pre-order, which is what, <laughs> yeah, pre-order sale is what this is. And that's that's kind of so. that's mostly what I wanted to mention because I mean a lot of people are hyped about this uh, YIO remote too. They like the design. They like that it's a touch screen. Uh, it's you know gonna be the oh we gotta switch back to Tom here so he can show his new baby Yoda. He's on a cup this now. Was, this is my wife gave me for my birthday. I bought myself a bike for my birthday, but Very she gave nice. me this. I think <laughs> I like this just as much as I like the bike. At least that's what I keep telling her. So, um, yeah, I, I just, my personal feelings, I hope I'm wrong, but this feels like much more of a an actual crowdfunding. It doesn't right. fully exist yet. I don't predict that they will hit that July 2022 shipping date because if they have not even begun manufacturing yet, they are more than, you know, half a year away. They right. they are one and a half to two years away. If uh, history is any indication of other Kickstarters that have been at a similar point when they did their Kickstarter beginning and then say this is when they're going to ship and it's usually at least a year longer than what they predict because making and shipping hardware is not easy and their software isn't finalized yet either. They've got a that's lot the part that, of work That's to the do. part that... that scares me more than anything is Uh, when you don't have the software done because you know my son and i know he's only in high school or whatever but he had a project last end of last year and it involved some programming to to program he he was building the robot mm -hmm. and he he had to program whatever it was supposed to do i can't remember what it was but um he left the programming till the end right but was busy building the robot (laughs) and then and then had like a week or two to do the program and he's like i can't make it work i'm like you never should have left a program <laughs> for the end. Like you never should have done that. Like I know you were working real hard on the actual the actual robot, but uh that's that programming will get yeah. you, man. Big but time. If anybody is asking this is purely opinion, uh, you know, yeah. should should you go out and join like Tom and I, we both put our money down for the Sofa Baton X one. But we took a look at it, and first of all, attractive price at under 100 bucks when you're joining the Kickstarter sure. pledge. So not a huge financial risk, even if something does go wrong. But also, they had already made and shipped the Sofa Baton U1. So we knew that this was a company that was capable of doing it. That software already exists. Putting that software onto the X1 is more of a tweak than it is actually building it from the ground up. They already have their huge database of IR and Bluetooth codes that exists. They're not still accumulating it and putting it together. They're growing it, but they didn't have to like grow it from scratch. And then, you know, everything about what Sofa Baton was saying was, yeah, like this exists. We're already making it. This is just right. for you to essentially pre-order the thing. So to me, there are big differences between the Sofa Baton X1 Kickstarter campaign and this YIO Remote 2 Kickstarter campaign. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't recommend that you go and put your money on this. If you do, that's okay. It's Kickstarter. But I would definitely expect that that July date is going to come and go and you are not going to have a remote in your hands. <laughs> that's my prediction on it. So uh, I feel differently about it. I hope I'm wrong, honestly, because more options is great. And that's what I want. And I want mm. this thing to be everything that they're planning and hoping it will be. But um, I- I'm playing it cautious and I-, I wouldn't be super hyped about it. Yeah, I'm with Rob. So uh, Epson Europe slash UK announced two new 4K laser-driven LCD projector models. They are expected to ship in the UK and some European countries this year, but won't be available in North America until sometime in 2022. Yeah. The LS 11,000. 
That's it. I don't know how else to say that. It just that's what it is. <laughs> is priced at forty one hundred pounds in the UK. It comes in a white chassis and is rated at twenty five hundred lumens. The RS twelve thousand, I mean LS twelve thousand, is priced at forty four hundred pounds and gets a black case with a small spec bump up to twenty seven hundred lumens. I don't know. Uh, unlike the previous <laughs> Epson laser models, the LS10,000 and the LS1050, 10,500. Yeah, there was a 10,000 and there was a 10,500. That's Those were the previous these, laser models. These use three LCD panel, three LCD, not three different. I don't know. Well, yeah, it is three LCD panels, three LCD, panels, three LCD, but three LCD also, is also LCD the trademark. All together, yeah. yes. Uh, but uh, not liquid crystal and quartz. It's similar dual blue light, a blue laser light engine with one of the blue lasers activating a yellow phosphor to create the red and green light sources. The marquee features are the 4K120 support with 40 gigabits per second, uh, HDMI 2.1 inputs, and HDR10+. There's so no mention of frame-by-frame -frame dynamic tone mapping, mapping, but they do have scene adaptive gamma, which sounds similar to Sony's dynamic HDR enhancement. So there's uh, still a huge lens shift and zoom range, all uh, zoom range, all motorized with lens memories and claim 2.5 million to one dynamic contrast. I, I just love it when they do dynamic contrast. Yep. It's like dynamic. It's dynamic. <laughs> Meaning we can turn the lasers ever, off. <laughs> you can, you'll never ever experience it, but it, we can make the if we if we if we. If we force it with special programming we can make it do this <laughs> uh we have to talk a bit about the 4k part of things they mentioned 8.3 million pixels specifically which would be full uhd resolution but they also mentioned their existing 4k pro uhd and 4k enhancement panel technology which were their names for pixel shifting or what we used to call wall bouquet mm -hmm. they do mention uh, specifically mention that the refresh rate is now 480 480 hertz so all of that suggests these are probably native 1080p resolution panels that are being flashed four times per frame to create 4k resolution refreshing those panels at 480 uh, 480 hertz would it still allow 4k 120 so we suspect that's what's going on here and what is allowing epson to hit these price points so instead of having essentially four well i mean the the jvcs were 8ks so they had well, 4k yeah. native, native 4k and resolution and yeah. then flashing them either twice in the case of the nz7 or four right. times per frame in the case of the nz8 and the nz9 that's right. how those ones are getting up to 8k so yeah um because, I mean, everywhere that was writing about it, they just called these 4K resolution projectors. But I'm looking at all the specs that are listed on Epson UK's own website, and it's like, 4K Pro UHD with 4K enhancement and 480 hertz panel refresh rate. I'm like, I'm just putting the pieces together. I go, I think these are 1080p resolution panels. They're being flashed four times per frame. They used to do it twice per frame. and right. the, But there's no reason why it would be a 480 hertz refresh rate if that's what they were doing. so And they specifically mention 8.3 million pixels on screen. I'm like, okay, well, that wouldn't be the case unless you were flashing a 1080p panel four times per frame. Right. So it all adds up. I don't think... I don't think I'm way out to lunch on this. We'll find out. But, uh, I, you know, given the price point, because they've switched to the laser light engine, so that's made them more expensive than, say, the 5050 UB and the 6050 UB. That went from lamps to lasers. But... The LS10,000, that was already like a $7,000 projector. And that was right. 1080p, but with a laser light engine. So I'm like, okay, so like 1080p panel uh, with a laser light engine. So I'm like, okay, so now they've brought laser light engine down and then saying 4K, like it, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up unless this is what's going on. The uh, the LS10,000 used to use liquid crystal on quartz. So that was closer to the liquid crystal on silicon that JVC and Sony use as well. Right. Um, yeah, so anyway... The good news is, if you were like, I want a projector that supports 4K 120, laser light engines are definitely the way things are going. And as somebody, one of our listeners uh, mentioned a while back, that's probably more to do with power consumption things than it is <laughs> like anything else. But that's fine. It gives you the wider color as a benefit too. So if you wanted those features, but don't want to start at $10,000 for a JVC and Z7, we don't know the North American prices yet, but very often it's like one for one UK pounds for US dollars these days. So right. even if it's more, even if it's 5,000 US dollars, that's still half still the less. price of an yeah. NZ7. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Look I mean, yeah, this does seem to be the, you know, I, I don't, you could say that out of all the, the technologies that are out there, that 8K could actually benefit projectors are literally it. <laughs> At least they have the sheer size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have the sheer size to get big enough where you might actually see a pixel at 4K. <laughs> um, you'd be way too close to the screen, but you could see it. Um, but I think, 
4K should be more than enough for most people sitting most distances from mm-hmm. most screens. Uh, 1080p was as well, but whatever. Uh, yeah, so we'll see. I mean, it, it's interesting to see the the 4K 120 and you know, everybody worrying yeah. about refresh rates and all these other things when I'm like, well, so the only thing that has that sort of native content is games. Yeah, games. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And projectors and games are like, they don't really go so well hand in hand as far as latency and everything else. So I it's don't all know improving that... though. Little by little, it's all improving. So no mention of VRR on any projectors yet. Haven't right. seen that anywhere, but uh, I'm happy to see the 4K 120 support. I like that. Whatever. I think it's. I, I think I think it's unnecessary, but whatever. Uh, it's old news now, but since we talked about it previously, Disney and Scarlett Johansson received reached a settlement out of court. I, I'm just I'm just shocked. It is. Both sides saying they are looking forward to continuing to work together after they were totally bad mouthing each other in the press. But you know, I mean, their lawyers were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we. Who was it that said that there was no way this was ever going to see the inside of a courtroom? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember who said that. Was it me or you or both? I think it was both. I think it was both. It was also everyone else who ever remarked on this. So I know it was we just were, dumb. We were not unique in the prediction, but that yeah. uh, that is the end of it. We have no idea what the terms are because it is a sealed settlement which doesn't I am necessarily sure someone knows <laughs> oh somebody behind the scenes knows and and i mean i guess uh, they're all talking about it I, the agents are talking amongst themselves <laughs> well, yeah. absolutely common knowledge within the industry because everyone else who wanted to sue over similar things uh wants to know that number wants, wants to, to know, know that number 100%. what kind of percentage scarlett johansson is getting because she's I mean, she deserves to get some kind of percentage because the original contract was she was supposed to get a percentage of the box well, office. And then they're like, but all the Disney Plus money just comes to Disney. And she's like, wait a second, that should yeah. be the same as box office. So no idea what the actual percentages end up being, but it's greater than zero. Right. Uh, right. And the fact that HBO Max has been, or HBO has been flipped flopping back and forth with uh <laughs> with uh dune and now it's back coming out day and date yeah I might tell you that that number was uh, was amicable enough that mm. hbo went well yeah we could pay that <laughs> <laughs> day and day uh, all right let's get to the questions here we're gonna try to power through these as fast as possible you know so keep your to a minimum rob you know what i'm talking about <laughs> but, oh yeah i'm always the one going off on tangents I, that's right. Always. I I'm always sticking me. to the topic at hand. I will not be <laughs> off on a tangent talking about bicycles, mm. dogs, or kids. Kids. It's pure technical knowledge from Tom. Every time That's it. you can count Every on time. it. Take it to the bank. Jonathan with the C Den 4.0 rebuild. I think that number keeps going up. Uh, with the ceiling down, he's taking our advice and running all the wall uh, wires above the ceiling and then down the walls behind the sheetrock. He'd like to maintain that clean look on the wall behind the AV receiver as well. So he's ordered some wall plates, but he's got a couple of questions. So he's got some links to the wall plates here with him. Mm-hmm. As far as the speaker wire and subwoofer RCA connections go, is there any concern at all that using the wall plates might degrade the signal quality? No. I agree. On those ones, I have zero concerns whatsoever about speaker wire or RCA cable signal degradation. That is not a concern. Not a concern. What about HDMI? He doesn't actually need HDMI 2.1 right now for his current TV, but it seems like it would be a better idea to run ultra-high-speed HDMI cables for right uh, right now for uh, uh, future-proofing purposes, right? Will the wall plate connectors be a problem for the HDMI 2.1? I don't actually know the answer to this question, but I am curious to hear what Rob says because mm. I am thinking the same thing. I, if it were me, I just run the cables straight out like a, those nose things. Yeah. I would just. Or there's the ones that. that kind of look, uh, they're almost like two stiff brushes. <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't slot. make a difference. It shouldn't because it's just basically wire <laughs> wire connection right across. It shouldn't make a difference, Except but that, HDMI is so weird. Yeah, it's and it's like really not recommended to couple together to ultra high speed HDMI cables. Um, it's such a delicate and insanely high bandwidth signal that's going across ultra high speed that um, like the extension cables that monoprice sells i think the longest one is three feet <laughs> like that's that's as much as we're gonna add <laughs> to uh to what's going on there so i have my hesitancy about saying that i think 
you're in the clear. Like I wouldn't feel confident saying I think you're in the clear uh, by using a wall plate coupler for two ultra high speed HDMI cables, especially depending on what length is going I in mean, there. He's probably going to be doing it at both ends too. So yeah, you know, yeah. And I mean, yeah. it sounds like in his setup, the equipment is you know like on a stand right below the television, so we're not talking about crazy long lengths. But nevertheless, my yeah. my instinct, what I feel more confident is saying is that I would prefer to just have a single ultra ultra high speed HDMI cable that plugs straight into the TV and goes through like basically openings in the wall instead of an HDMI coupler. I'm not super confident in that when it comes to ultra high speed HDMI cables. So, uh, hopefully I'm wrong about that. Hopefully you can trust it, but, um, given that extension cables for ultra high speed, uh, HDMI cables are so short and really not recommended. I don't feel super comfortable saying use the wall plate for those. I would agree. His Denon X4400H receiver survived the flood caused by Hurricane Ida. You should have pushed it off <laughs> to the water. Tipped just, it. Like, just tipped it in. Who would know? <laughs> Is that model capable of sending HDMI 2.1 signals, or will they need a future AV receiver upgrade for that? Uh, you'll need an upgrade. You will indeed. Yeah, if you want it to go through the AV receiver, the receiver itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could... Uh, potentially use something like the only ultra high speed uh, HDMI matrix switch with audio extraction that I know of right now, and that is HD Fury's 8K Vroom, uh, which is going to be $500. You can still purchase it at the pre-order price for about $450 as we're recording this. Uh, but that's a pretty expensive price that gets you probably halfway to a new AV receiver anyway. So that that would be something to consider. But uh, as far as just plugging an ultra high speed HDMI cable straight into your X4400H, not going to work. That, that absolutely cannot handle HDMI 2.1 signals uh, and that level of bandwidth at all. Right. Uh, in the old theater setup, he had initially run Odyssey, but earlier this year, before the flood, he'd, he had hired a professional calibrator to go through a virtual calibration with him via video chat. Mm -hmm. They used true RTA software and a UMic one, and they adjusted the graphic EQ on of his Denon rather than using Odyssey at all. He was happy with the end results. So is it the case that if you want to manually EQ and calibrate your system, you have to turn Odyssey off? Is it one or the other? Never both. That means he can't use dy dynamic EQ, correct? He's never been 100% sure about all of that. Yeah, in order to have to use dynamic EQ, you have to have used you have to have used Odyssey as far yes, as I mean, I've never sure. seen any way of turning on anything that's Odyssey without having run Odyssey first. Um, but if you generally if you calibrate to the listening level that you normally listen at, you know, the volume level that you normally listen at, there is no reason why you have to worry about dynamic eq if that makes sense like if you're always in here and the volume level you normally listen at is the volume level you always listen at yeah like, very consistent on that very consistent then um you adjusting the volume up and down based on how the content was mixed mm. shouldn't shouldn't make that much difference as far as the base which is what dynamic eq is doing Primarily, uh, th yeah. that being said i would still use Odyssey. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm very glad that you were happy with the end result. That is what yeah. matters. But the graphic EQ, uh, that's the manual EQ that you can adjust in a Denon or Marantz, that's pretty limiting. Um, it doesn't have nearly the, the finite control that Odyssey has access oh, to. Or even, even if you went in and got a, uh, an off, like a, I mean, a DSP or some sort of other, sure. uh, you know, a, other... A device that had EQ properties, mm -hmm. they would all be way more powerful than what's in your Denon. Yeah, because like the graphic EQ, that is, it's fixed frequency points, it's fixed widths, right, and all you're right. adjusting is the uh, up and down amplitude of those fixed frequency points. It is literally tens of thousands fewer filters than what Odyssey right. Multi-EQ XT32 offers. Like that, that is no exaggeration. It is tens of thousands fewer filters and um, much less capable filters. It is just an infinite impulse response filter. Uh, like I say, you can't even adjust the width so it's not parametric. Like Yamaha has an advantage there. Yamaha's manual EQ outside of YPOW is at least a parametric EQ where you can adjust right. the frequency that's in the center, how wide the filter is, and then the up and down of that filter. This is just straight graphic EQ. So I'm happy you were happy with the results. That That's 
fine, but this is a much less capable system of, of EQing your system via the graphic EQ that's built into the Denon. So my approach would be uh, if you just run Denon at its default and you're like, I, I don't really like, love the results, um, I would use the Odyssey Editor app. In a heartbeat, I would pay the $20, $25, whatever it is now, and get the Odyssey right. Editor app because your, your X4400H, um, I think that was the first year, the first model year that supported the Odyssey Editor Mine app. Mine supports it, yeah. Yeah, it does. It does support that app, and I would... You know, I mean, if you want to go through that with a professional via uh, via video chat, I mean, maybe at the time this uh, professional didn't even know all the ins and outs of the Odyssey editor app because it might have been at the time when it was really quite new. But isn't the I mean, I can't I, I I'll be honest, I've never used the Odyssey editor app to adjust the 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 target curve. But okay, can you do that very? F- I always thought you just kind of like pushed up and down on the line. It, it is. I mean, very, it's, it's, it's with it's a finger. It's not like finite. <laughs> it's with yeah, a finger. Yeah. But if you're doing it on, say, a tablet instead of a phone, um, right. I mean, you can you can get pretty darn granular with it as long as you're patient with yourself and you're okay with adjusting the target get, curve. Get it a little stylus. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, it gives um, you more, finite, more, yeah, that, more precise control. That is the way I would come at it for sure. And I mean, it might take some trial and error. And if you're doing the proper full eight measurements every time you're rerunning Odyssey, and I mean, you start it in the editor app, you uh, get all of your settings the way you want it in the editor app, including the target curve, and then you go ahead and run Odyssey from the editor yeah. app, and that's going to still involve taking eight measurement positions. So if there's some trial and error, yeah, it's a it can be a lengthy and a tedious process. I'm not going to try and sugarcoat that, and maybe that's exactly why he wanted to do it this way that he was used to, but the, the capabilities of that graphic EQ are really quite limiting, so it's and not I, what I would I, recommend. I would think back to your experience with that uh, with that person. Whether it was at the EQ person that you that, didn't mention that a name, so we worked with. I know, but uh, the Calabria that you worked with—that yeah. was the word I was looking for. And try to remember your interaction because they sales is sales, and what that person does is sales. They are yes, they're helping you with your EQ and stuff like that, but they're selling you the result. Is what sure. they're selling you. Sure. So you know, we've talked about it a thousand times on this podcast. How when you go to listen to new speakers, they're going to tell you they like insist on telling you what you're going to hear before they turn anything on. They love doing that, and it's a psychological tactic that uh, that mm. prepares <laughs> your mind that that biases you towards hearing the thing that they just said. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And you think, okay, well, that's just something that they do, and that no. It's everywhere. I bought, when I went to bike shopping, the same thing happened. He was like, you're going to notice that this, this, and this, now that you've got this new bike. I'm like, damn you. Now, if I notice that, it's all going to be suspect to me because you have, yeah, I know the psychological trick. Right, right. So if you think back to the calibration. And even if you're aware it, of it, it still works. It's one of those it things. It still works. Oh, that's the thing. It just works it, on humans, it, even if you know it's coming. Even if you know it's coming, even if you're well aware of the phenomenon, you're, it still works. You yep. can't help it. So think back to your interaction with this guy and say to yourself, okay, Yo, how many did how many things did he prep me for? How you know, what kind of little tricks and stuff did he did he use? And he, I mean, it's just good sales. So I, I don't think it's necessarily malicious. It's more like I'm educating my customer on what mm. they because they don't know what to listen for. So I'm helping them do it. So mm. I don't think it's necessarily the maybe as malicious oh, yeah, it as I'm making it nefarious. sound. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, yeah. but it's it it works. So. Mm. I, you know, my big question is: After you did this graphical EQ thing, did you go back and forth between that and mm-hmm. Odyssey, and and A B it really in any way, shape, or form? Because my guess would be that uh, you know you went from you you turned everything off, you reset everything, and then you listened to it, and then you did the whole graphic EQ thing, and then you listened to it, and you're like, yeah, it's way better. I really like this. <laughs> or maybe they and just put a big old bass boost in there, and it really was obvious, and you definitely could hear it. Uh, but right. I just wanted to answer really clearly for Jonathan. Yes, if you activate the graphic EQ in a Denon or Marantz, that turns Odyssey off. You cannot yes. have the graphic EQ on at the same time as Odyssey, and vice versa. You cannot have o- Odyssey on at the same time as the graphic EQ. So those two things are mutually exclusive, and if you are using the graphic EQ, there is no way that you're using Odyssey dynamic EQ. That can only work if Odyssey is on, and if Odyssey is on, the graphic EQ is off. So I think that's very clear. Infinite Gary. Gary says he isn't really enjoying HDR content on his OLED. Uh, SDR just looks more natural, less fatiguing to his eyes. 1080p Blu-rays still look bold, bright, and high contrast. But HDR on Ultra HD Blu-rays looks over the top. It isn't pleasant. 
or it isn't a pleasant experience, a viewing experience for him. That mm -hmm. said, sometimes the best quality, both video and audio, is only on the 4K disc. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to watch Ultra HD Blu-rays on his OLED, but just with just the HDR part turned off? Mm -hmm. So he wants 4K, but not HDR. Yeah. Still uh, Atmos or DTSX sound. Uh, you could just go but, buy an old one that doesn't do HDR. Oh, so like an old 4K non HDR television. HDR, just, and then it will do it for you automatically. Yeah, I don't think there's any that. option for that when it comes to OLED, though. And he still wants Probably all the OLED not. goodness. Um, so, first of all, just on the whole topic so of. First of all, how long is this going to take? Oh, um, not too long. Maybe. Okay, three. I'm just going to get a cup of coffee. My coffee's <laughs> empty. I always forgets before. Um, so, first of all, on the topic of not really enjoying the look of HDR, preferring the more limited uh, dynamic range of standard dynamic range, I don't really blame you. I, I see where you're coming from. And um, like for the people who are all about, let's get to 10,000 nit peaks, uh, I'm I'm with Gary, closer to Gary, uh, of being in the camp where I'm like, I, I don't really want that. I've certainly watched HDR content that has made me squint. And I don't enjoy that experience. Um, I like the theater experience where I can go in there and my pupils can dilate and open up and they can remain that way. And my pupils don't have to constrict when they're hit by higher knit, higher light levels that uh, cause my pupil to constrict. And then when it goes back to a dark scene, it takes it takes much longer for your pupils to open back up than it does for them to close down. So um, I'm, I'm on board, Gary. I, I'm closer to you than I am to the people who are, you know, wanting 10,000 nit stuff. Um, and also on that point, this is uh, a link that we'll have in the show notes over at CNET. Uh, they've got an article up about, you know, eye pain may actually uh, be your TV's fault and here's what you can do about it. And it's, you know, adjusting some of the settings and maybe turning, just turning down that OLED light setting, that uh, now relabeled brightness on some telev television setting. It's akin to the backlight on a, uh, you know, uh, LED uh, based LCD. So just turning that down, you don't have to necessarily leave that set at 100 and pegged all the way up and you can maybe make hdr a little bit more comfortable to view that way without actually turning it off but if you want to do exactly what you asked about uh the only real way i can think of doing it is via an hd fury device that's going to spoof the edid information and i don't think you know, need to go super high up in uh, hd fury's lineup i'm actually thinking the dr hdmi 4k or it's on the thing itself labeled as Dr. HDMI UHD. Uh, but that one there, you could set it to 4K, but SDR only. And that's the EDID information that it would end up sending to your player. So your player would then assume, okay, I can send uh, 4K resolution, but not the HDR part of it. And your player would then go into its HDR to SDR conversion mode. Um, because as far as just doing it without any device in between, uh, just some setting in the television itself, I'm not aware of, of that being a possibility. I don't know any way to make that happen. You could, I suppose, um, in the inputs menu, set your HDMI inputs down to standard instead of enhanced so that they're stuck at HDMI 1.4 instead of HDMI 2.0, but that might also force you down to 1080p resolution instead mm. of 4K resolution. Uh, uh, you could give that a try because that's a setting you could try without destroying anything. So just manually set in the inputs menu uh, down to standard instead of enhanced uh, and see if that gets you the results that you want. But if not, the Dr. HDMI from HD Fury should be able to do this. Bill. Bill made some major upgrades to his home theater. He upgraded to a 7.2.6 configuration mm -hmm. powered by Denon X6700H. He has installed two rows of theater seats and with tractile, tactile, tractile. <laughs> I need one of the, I need a tractile transit, something that puts me in traction <laughs> ah, yeah. every once in a while. Uh, tactile transducers for them. For his dual subs, he mostly followed Rob's 12-step guide. <laughs> mostly. He got to one point just with, you know what? Nah. It's too much trouble. That's enough. So he set up his Denon to only use one of its subwoofer outputs, and then he used a mini DSP to adjust the delays and levels for the two subs, but not to apply EQ. Equalization was left to Odyssey after he achieved good uniformity across his seats, mm -hmm. but he wants to connect his tactile transducer. He was hoping he could just turn on the second subwoofer output on his Denon and not have any EQ applied to it <laughs> since he had only ever run Odyssey with one subwoofer output active. That's not going to work. It is. Not. But as soon as he turns on the second subwoofer output, it tells him he needs to rerun Odyssey. Yep. And that isn't going to work when one of the subwoofer outputs is connected to tactile transducers that don't make any sound. Uh, 
he's thought about connecting a temporary subwoofer to the sub two output so that Odyssey can run. But there's a way to turn off the automatic EQ for sub two, but not sub one. Uh, there is no. no way to do that. Yeah, the way Odyssey Malt EQ XT32 with sub EQHT, which is the full name of what Odyssey is running on your X6700H, the way that works is it plays a test tone out of subwoofer one, but it uses that only to set the level and distance of sub, no sub number one. Then it does the same thing on sub number two, test tone out of sub two, but it's only setting the level and distance. Then it plays them together in mono for the actual equalization part of it. So there's no way to do what you're envisioning where sub yeah. output two of your Denon is an unequed, uh, completely independent uh, right. base output from sub uh, output number one. There's, there's just no way to do that in your Denon by itself. No, not right now. Uh, if tra tactile transducers were more of a common thing, you might see receiver manufacturers having an output that was specific for them, but they're mm. just so uncommon. <laughs> uh, they, they just have never caught on, uh, never gotten big enough for them to mm. care enough for that. I mean, we're trying to get them to, to just do mono outputs on yeah. their, you know, the, I mean, that's the what stereo it subwoofer <laughs> output, the, the way it used to be. And uh, they won't they won't even give us the option of putting it back the way it used to be. So. <laughs> but that wouldn't help in this instance. That wouldn't help still in this be instance. an equalized signal coming. So out he's read online that the way to do this is to run Odyssey as normal with just the sub one output going into the mini DSP and then use the third output of the mini DSP to feed a, a signal to the tactile transducers and manually apply the EQ to that third output to counteract whatever Odyssey does. That sounds like a pain. Is there a more elegant solution? Can I? No. <laughs> the more elegant solution, honestly, I'll be honest with you. The more elegant solution is just to connect the, the tactile transducers to another one of your mini DSP outputs and hope it's not weird. That's oh. the, that's the, you know, nah. the chances <laughs> I'm not sure are I would use the word be... elegant for that. That's, that's more no. of wishing a prayer approach. <laughs> well, I mean, I, that, that, that would be the first thing I would do. I would just, I would just connect it up and hope because that's, ah. you know, there, there's really, there's really very little else you can do, but yes, the honest way to do this is to, you know, basically play it without Odyssey mm -hmm. and then play it with Odyssey uh, using Rumi Q Wizard to mm -hmm, see mm -hmm. the difference mm -hmm. and then make uh, inverse wave, an inverse, uh, an inverse yeah. uh, uh, correction calibration yeah. uh, for that. Which, then, um, you know, Rumi Q Wizard can, can generate for you. It's actually right. quite handy in that way. So, I mean, it is a pain. It's certainly not zero work. Uh, there's going to be measurement involved. If you don't already have a measurement microphone and Rumi Q Wizard, then you're going to be investing in those. Um, but yeah, what you described is the the probably the best way to handle this because the only other way you could really come at it would be you could use the Odyssey Editor app to just curtain off the subwoofer output entirely. In essence, have Odyssey not do anything to the subwoofer output. Now, Odyssey would still be active. It could still apply its equalization uh, however you want to all of the other speakers. So this isn't turning Odyssey off entirely. You would just be using the app to curtain off the subwoofer output so that it's not applying any equalization to the subwoofer output. That then gets fed into the mini DSP. And now you leave all of the equalization duties to the mini DSP, right? So what we've traded is now you're getting just the original unaltered signal coming out of the subwoofer output of the Denon. That can go straight, you know, it can go from the third output of your mini DSP straight into a tactile transducer. Um, that'll work. Or you could, even in this instance, actually have both subwoofer outputs active on the Denon. <laughs> and feed the second sub output from the Denon since it's not being equalized at all inside the Denon uh, and feed that to your tactile, tactile transducers either way. But now all of the equalization duties of your subwoofers have to be handled in the mini DSP, right? That's, right. that's the trade-off. And so you're still going to end up wanting to measure. You're still going to want to end up using Room EQ Wizard and have Room EQ Wizard uh, calculate the correction file for your subwoofers now instead of just creating an inverse 
of what was done when you measure Odyssey versus no Odyssey and applying that inverse to the tactile transducer output. So, I mean, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. You know, if you were already thinking what I actually want to do is manually EQ my subs and apply a house curve anyway, okay, that could be a way to do it. You curtain it off in the Odyssey editor app so that Odyssey doesn't EQ the subwoofer output. That would be the alternate approach. But the amount of work and the amount of measurement you're going to need to do, really not very different from one another. So uh, that is as good as the solution can be right now. I guess the only other solution that I can think of, I guess that would be actually fit into the more elegant camp would be mm -hmm. if you only really use your your tactile transducers with one source mm -hmm. and you have mm -hmm. uh, some sort of LFE or a, you know, uh, you know, an, uh, an RCA output from that source that would transport the base, you could connect it directly into the the amp for your for your tactile. How transducers many sources still have like multi-channel uh, analog? I know you, that... it's it's a it's a long shot. But if you That's had like a, a higher if, if you had a higher end uh, <laughs> ultra Blu-ray player that had free outs right. as well as, okay. uh, as HDMI and they were all active. <laughs> yeah. At the and same that's time. That's the only source that you. That's the only source where you ever well, use tactile transducers with it. I would make the it. argument wow. that you that that it is it could be the case that that would be the only source that you were Maybe. you were using. So. Yeah, it's it's a long shot. That's but that's the only right. other way you can do this. So there's the, there's there's the don't use your room EQ or your room yeah. you know, or just get get it off like Rob said. In terms of what I would recommend, I think you are already there. You all you yeah. have all you actually need to do from where you are currently is measure the subwoofer output Odyssey on versus Odyssey off, and create the inverse. Uh, of, of that difference and apply it to the third output of your mini DSP. Uh, I think that is that is the least amount of work for you to do and it will be very effective and work the way it's supposed to. Hmm. Excuse me. John. John is trying to select a fabric for some DIY acoustic panels and he wants to have images printed on them. He wants to buy the fabric from a site called Contrado.com. Contrado, I think. Contrado? There's no L in there. There's no L, L. There should be, though. Because I'm thinking Contralto. Contralto. Anyways. Contrado. Contrado. Anyways, they suggest going with their speaker fabric. Uh, but he wondered if their net fabric might be an even better choice. So it's going to lot block any sound waves. Speaker fabric shouldn't block any sound waves by definition. And yeah, that net fabric makes no sense to me. I'm like, dude, your images are going to look all washed out and literally visible holes in them. I think you are worrying much more about acoustic oh, transparency yeah. on acoustic panels than you need to. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. The, the speaker fabric all the way. <laughs> like yeah, Literally yeah. no question in my mind that that is the yeah. better choice than the net fabric. I, I don't like the look of that net fabric so at net, all. For those of you that can't see, basically, the speaker fabric is, you know, it looks like speaker grill fabric. It has colors. Yeah. It's white, but it has colors and stuff on it. But it just looks like normal fabric. The net fabric looks like it has massive holes in it, which, of course, yeah. is more acoustically transparent. But sure. at what point do you... <laughs> you know, are you acoustically transparent enough? And since you're mostly worried about catching the bass or as much bass as possible, you don't have to be that acoustically transparent. But you yeah. just you want to be as as much as you can. This is a little bit too much. John is very interested in using the duct butter approach for hardening the edges of in some installations so that he can build frameless DIY base traps. He wants to make four base traps that are three feet wide by six feet tall by six inches deep. In this Ooh. email, he three <laughs> feet wide, four feet tall, six, six feet inches tall. deep. Six feet tall, sorry. Three by six by six inches. Okay. Yeah. Big panels. Those are those are, those are whoppers. In this email, he proposed the following plan. Get four uh, six packs of rock wool comfort board 80 rigid insulation. Each piece is two feet by four feet by two inches thick. Cut each piece to be two feet by three feet. So he's losing a foot off of each one. Uh -huh. Then create stacks. Uh, this doesn't make much sense. This is, this is what I, was written, so we're going to okay. go through it. Uh, then create stacks that uh, that are three pieces tall to make them three feet by six feet each. And then three pieces deep to make them six inches deep. The math doesn't add up even when using the pieces that were cut off, but that will likely end up being moot when we answer all of this. Yeah. But okay, whatever. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure, really sure what's going on with this math here because even, yeah, even I mean, though was, I'm trying to talk and... Make, make it make sense for you 
and I'm trying to do the math in my head. And I'm I'm probably failing on all three. Fronts. So I mean, if you take a it a two foot by four foot piece, cut off one foot, so now it's two feet by three feet, and yeah. then you put two feet on top of two feet on top of two feet. Okay, now you're three feet by six feet. That works out. But there are six pieces in each pack. It's a six pack, so you could make two of those you could make three feet by six feet twice but now that's four inches thick not six inches thick so how he thought he was going to get three of them deep and three of them tall that math does i mean you can just buy more that you can make it work but um right yeah that's that's i, I something got lost in the math there but whatever that was that was what was described so just want to point that out <laughs> that you're going to need to buy more than you thought you did if you do it that way so he says he's going to harden all the edges and stick all the pieces together using the duct butter. Then wrap the whole three foot by six foot by six inch stack in burlap. And then use duct butter on the burlap to stiffen that too. He figures that will make them sturdy and rigid. Then wrap all of that in acoustic fabric for the final exterior look. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this plan. I, I will say straight up, um, I'm not a fan of this no. plan. <laughs> Not really sure why this there's all of this. So for mounting, he proposed stitch uh, neodymium bar magnets to the burlap on the backs of these base traps, then have painted metal strips on the walls, which will hopefully make adjustments and uh, hopefully make adjustments and optional removal of the panels easier. Anchor the painted metal strips to the sheetrock with expander screws and use six neodymium bar magnets per panel since uh, each three foot by six foot by six inch panel will weigh, weigh about 60 pounds. So will this work? <laughs> Do we have refinements to this suggest or is this whole thing going to be a crapshoot? First of all, I think the first time you stick those neodymium magnets down on that bar is the last time you they will be connected to your <laughs> panels. I think that is literally the last time. I think the minute you try to take those things off the wall, those you're going to pull them absolutely free of those neodymium magnets right um yeah 60 pounds is a lot that okay. is a uh, lot the, a that's a, a, it so i i, I kind of get what he's going for here uh i i still think making a frame will be if you want panels easier. this size you yeah. definitely want a frame not only that there is no reason why you need six inches of actual insulation. If you have a frame, the frame can be six inches deep and right. four inches of insulation plus a two inch air gap is going to be just as effective, acoustically speaking, cheaper because it's less material and way less because it's four inches instead of six inches deep. So I think he's he's like John has been very focused on trying to do everything for the lowest price possible. And I think he's gone so far down that route that he's actually costing himself more money than doing the simpler solution. Like he's so focused on not paying for the cost and materials of, of a frame yeah. that you've ended up making these panels way more complicated, way heavier, way harder to mount, way harder to wrap because you've got no, you know, I mean, everything is relying on the duct butter as being your stiff surface and like gluing your fabric to that is not super trivial. I 100% say you get yourself a four by eight sheet of whatever material, MDF or plywood or OSB or whatever. You cut that to your, you know, three foot by six inch, uh, six foot size and you, you make yourself a frame. It's so much easier. And honestly, I don't, I think it will actually end up costing you less because you don't need six inches of insulation for each of these. You only need four. Right. And it, then you don't need the, the burlap wrap plus the fabric wrap, just the fabric wrap. The, the burlap is gone. And if you want that sort of angled, if you want the angled uh, edge that you sometimes see on the, on the, um, you can just, you can just use a, you can just route out the oh, edge yeah. of the wood. Or just bevel yourself. it, just, just yeah. camp for it. And then uh, and then as far as hanging it, forget all this bar magnet stuff and everything. If you've got just a, a fr like just a simple frame, the simplest frame you can imagine, that's all we're talking about here. And once you've gotten that, you, you hang it on some nails that you put into some studs in the wall. Like you don't need anything fancy. You've saved all the money on the neodymium wow. magnets. Those weren't going to be super cheap. There's drywall anchors that supposedly, and I don't know how. No, they but he's going to be three feet, this. three feet wide and six feet tall. You can definitely go across two studs. There's even no reason why you couldn't. Even right. if you're and, 24 yeah. inches on center, there's no reason yeah. why panels that big can't go I don't across. Know why two he studs. needs him to be so wide? Like I, this all seems like a waste to me. Like, like cutting just off make material, panels and, like and either make them, them smaller or make them bigger. 
Yeah. Right? Either make them two feet wide, like sure. the panels normally are. Or like or if, make he's, them if he's envisioning four feet wide. <laughs> three feet by six feet, like you make them one foot by six foot or something. Even that could work. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's it's, many simpler ways to do this, John. That's where we're coming at. I think the neodymium magnets alone will cost more than exactly. Than everything yeah, else. yeah. I just, I like, just, I, I think he went. I, you so, lost me there for sure. So far down the idea that the frame is what's costing him money that you just lost the forest for the trees on this one. Ultimately, like there, there, are, there is a point if you're just if you're just gonna take. 24 inch on center bats of insulation. You're not going to cut them. You're not going to layer them. You're not going to do anything to them. You're just going to take them out of the package, harden the edges, and put some fabric around it. That's cheaper. All right. But what you're talking about is much more complicated and much more involved. And the simplicity of just having a frame the size that you want and the depth that you want and allowing yourself to use less insulation because having the air gap is every bit as effective as having that additional two inches of insulation. That is 100% a way I would do this. Forget the magnets, forget the burlap. That's going to be cheaper, faster, and easier. Yeah. And once you have that, it, that gap in there, it makes mounting them like a, oh, a completely yeah. trivial thing. Exactly. You just get a wire or you can put a French cleat or whatever. Yeah. Like I said, uh, you, with, I mean, being, you can just put two nails into the two studs and hang the panel on it. Off of that, right. <laughs> uh, I, I link up, we will link up my article on how to install acoustic panels sure. the right way on AV gadgets, which has a, cu- a couple of tips about making sure that the panels don't vibrate on the wall, as well as how to uh, use... Uh, the hanging wire mm-hmm. and uh, you're going to find I mean you're going to find this is a lot easier than neodymium magnets Derek Derek's thinking about getting a Yamo Studio S speaker package that's available on Amazon for $240 for $240 I, it's a good deal I'm going to look at it mm-hmm. yep, they look like speakers <laughs> they sure do Yamo does I mean, know how to make speakers I mean generally speaking in Yamo, I mean I would if I didn't click on this and see tiny cubes I was going to be happy <laughs> so this is Five speakers, no sub. Which That's correct. Yeah, it's a 5.0 package, but 240 bucks. You can't complain about that price point. Consists of one pair of the S803 bookshelves, one pair of the smaller S801s, and one of the S81 center. Why did yep. they just call it a C? Whatever. Are these Yamo speakers any good? I mean, generally speaking, Yamo speakers are pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, these, I look at them just glancing at them. Uh, I don't know how big they are, but they seem to be. They, 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 they. Nothing. No red flags go off. Yeah, the eight hundred three. That's a six and a half inch driver in there, and it's five. Is it and a, really? Five and a oh, quarter wow. in the other two. So these, these aren't dinky by any means. Um, I have not heard these in person. I've been yeah. very interested in them. They've got actually some very nice finish options. I'm just showing the basic black that's there, but they've got white and they've got a wood grain finish that's available to them. Very attractive price points on these. The two hundred forty dollars for this five pack is like really discounted. So. Um, that that that's that's all good um multiple reviews have been done on these going to link up to joe and tells because he goes through it nicely and actually has some measurements and all of the reviews agree these have a smiley face curve they have a smiley face curve to them really not surprising i mean yamo is part of the same company as klipsch and um you know for inexpensive speakers having a smiley face curve built into them tends to make them sound more impressive on first blush right you're like ooh, they're detailed and there's more bass than i expected because they got a smiley face curve in them but that can be EQ'd out pretty effectively, honestly, if you're attaching them to an AV receiver uh, that, you know, lets you tailor the target curve. Uh, you can EQ that out if you want to. And yeah, I mean, nobody is coming back and saying, oh, these are atrocious, avoid them speakers. Uh, absolutely not. Everyone is agreeing that they're a good value. They just do have a bit of a smiley face curve to them. So um, my, my feeling on them is good value i mean at this very very low entry level price uh i've I've got really no beef with them yeah that's my tape i do like that amazon lists is waterproof false <laughs> like yeah uh, okay they are yeah uh yeah. it does look like that the the smaller speakers that the so the bigger uh bookshelves that are up front yeah the 803s are, fr- are front ported a yeah. slot port up front it yeah. does look like they the smaller ones have a slot port in the back they do yeah they got a li- so little bitty port on the back yeah yeah uh, this these would not be speakers I would sit super far away from. I will tell you okay. that much. Uh, They're pretty I, I decently would, efficient, though, but by, by the specs yeah. anyway. 
Yeah, I would start worrying about port noise, just mm. generally speaking. Uh, yeah, they're not crazy are... high power handling, nor yeah, would you yeah. expect it at this price point. No, but... no, it's not at this price point. So, like, if you're setting this up in a smaller room and you are, you know, on the budget, I think that these mm -hmm. look like a perfectly reasonable option to start with. So the Yamo Studio S series has a dedicated Atmos-enabled modules that can and must be plugged into the tops of the 803 bookshelf speakers to fire upwards at the ceiling these S8 models, I, I hate the numbers so bad, uh, cannot be used on, on their own. The only way they work is if they're plugged into the top of a compatible Yamo speaker model. Are these modules worth it? Do they work? I'm sure they work. <laughs> well, I mean, they function. They put sound out. There's the whole thing about upward firing Atmos speakers in general, uh, where we're still under the impression that the lion's share of, of uh, psychoacoustically what's going on there is thanks to uh, Dolby's target curve that they apply, they apply anytime you say you have Dolby enabled speakers in your AV receiver, it applies this pretty darn funky uh, EQ curve to them that's meant to mimic the head related transfer function that tells our brain that the sound is coming from above us instead of in front of us or behind us. Um, so, I mean, all of that put together, I've certainly listened to a number of upward firing Atmos modules. I have not listened to these Yamos in particular. So unfortunately I can't say exactly where I would rank them. I, I still rank PSB's upward firing modules as the very best ones that I've ever heard. The, the most convincing that the sound is actually coming from overhead. I think Klipsch's are probably second best and I actually own some of the Klipsch upward firing ones. Uh, so these Yamos, I don't know. Um, the design of them, it like doesn't really adhere to Dolby's recommendation of how to build an upward firing speaker, but nobody besides PSB does. <laughs> so everybody's done this similar sort of uh, 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 coaxial type of design, which is exactly what they've gone for here. So I'm not like super gung-ho on them. I don't like the fact that if they just don't have any speaker binding posts, that the only way to use them is with the compatible Yamo speakers. You cannot plug these into the smaller S801s. I, that's what I was looking for. I'm literally yeah, looking at the top of those speakers right now, trying to figure out if they would work. Yeah, and no, they, they, they only they only go into the 803s for the bookshelves, and then there are three different sizes of towers in the Yamo uh, Studio Series lineup, and they only work with the two larger tower models. There's the, the smallest tower model aren't compatible with these upward five firing modules either so you do have to make sure and so i mean this system if you got the five speakers in that package plus one pair of the modules you can go to five point however many subwoofers point two but there is no way to use that package to make it five point whatever point four uh you can't plug these into the tops of the 801s so I hem and haw on whether I really think they're worth it. My instinct would be to get a different pair of speakers and just physically mount them up high somewhere. I think that will deliver better results and more flexibility. But if you absolutely cannot mount speakers up high, either on the uh, ceiling or high up on your walls, uh, and you, you have to use upward firing, well, then it makes sense to get the ones that just plug into the tops. But uh, if you want four of them, you'll have to get an additional pair of speakers separate from what's in that Yamo package because the 801s aren't compatible. Yeah. It does say in the manual that they are compatible with 803. So you can work. Oh, absolutely. 803s, 805s, 807s, or 809s. So those are your options. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just get regular old speakers to put them on the ceiling. I don't think that's my instinct. If you can, yeah. I would go for regular speakers and not these Yamos because you can't use them separate from the other speakers. Right. I am always against proprietary connections whenever yeah, possible. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And especially in this hobby where people upgrade all the time, having something with a proprietary connection just sort of screams, I want you to waste money or I want to lock you into my ecosystem. <laughs> you know, and there's no reason for you to do this when you could literally just buy another Atmos module that's meant to, be, to sit right. on top of a, you know, I mean, what, ELAC makes them, uh, Klipsch makes them. Aperion you know, makes them. You can you can buy this and put it on top of your Yamo speakers, and right. you don't have to use a stupid connection. So I would just all do of those that. do cost more though. Got to <laughs> got to factor that in there. The Yamos That's are true, inexpensive, but then again, you're not locked into the stupid ecosystem. That's right. So yeah. you can yeah. use them with a future system. Whereas the Yamo, if you get rid of the Yamo 803s, you are also getting rid of those Atmos modules. I bet you could take a, a prime elevation speaker and just sit it on top of a flat speaker. I'm pretty darn <laughs> I bet sure it would, it would work, work work just fine. Not that not that they've ever suggested that you do so, but I bet it would work just fine. Yeah. So in the end, Derek wants to end up with a 7.2.4 configuration. His budget is such that about $300 a pair is the sort of price rate he's looking at for speakers. Ideally, he liked bookshelf front speakers with matching center and wall surrounds. 
possibly in wall surround backs or at least compatible on walls and he's okay with upward firing atmos modules as long as they sound good so the the yamos we've been talking about fit the bill or would we suggest uh what would we suggest at his at the sort of price point yeah so i mean the yamos he was talking about way below this price yeah point. way 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 below and i mean i can see the appeal because if you can basically get your entire system he hasn't for... told us anything about his room though right we're just nah, going off i don't know the room what he, what he yeah. wants for his price point here yeah yeah, yeah. but um yeah uh, I mean, I've got I've got suggestions. Um, I can give you a couple of suggestions that immediately leap to mind. Uh, when you say three hundred dollars a pair, I instantly think Ascends HTM two hundred SEs. <laughs> Honestly, you could grab seven of those. Um, seven of those with shipping included is under eleven hundred dollars. So we're right in that target price range. Um, I really love the HTM two hundred SEs. Very versatile, sealed, so you can absolutely mount them on the wall uh, if you want to. They're very very forgiving of placement. Um, they work fantastic across the front as your front three. So instantly I think of those now. He said ideally he would have in-wall surround speakers. Uh, and so when we're talking in-walls or in-ceilings to go along with Ascend, Sonance is, is what I think of all the time. That's what Dave Fabricant over at Ascend himself recommends anytime someone wants uh, a good match either in-wall or in-ceiling to the Ascend SE series speakers. So Sonance... Um, if you uh, the price on the in walls is a little bit higher best buy is probably the easiest place to find them so uh you'd be looking at the vp62s that would be the the most comparable model now the regular price is 480 dollars a pair for those that these we're talking the in wall as rounds here uh however they do have them open box for 360 dollars a pair so we're, we're pretty close there and that's with like truly open box where there's absolutely no damage to them whatsoever so you can get a pair of those and then maybe still just have htm 200 se's mounted on your back wall uh i would also be looking at you know actual in ceiling speakers for your atmos positions now there uh thankfully as we're recording this the mag 6 that i always like to recommend for some crazy reason the retail price is 600 dollars a pair they're 130 dollars a pair as we're recording this right now over on best buy and i normally i see them get down to 200 dollars a pair and i think they're a pretty darn good deal at that why they're all the way down to 130 dollars a pair that's kind of crazy so i don't know hop on those you'll also want to get the back cans that go along with them those are only 60 dollars a pair so you know at the moment at the sale price you're under 200 dollars a pair uh definitely within your price range for what you described there to get the in ceiling so that's all ascend and sonance working together uh, i think that's a pretty good solution now, if you were just looking for something that's more efficient, because again, we don't know room size if you're trying to get you know, more efficient speakers at this sort of price point, uh, I think of HSU and their horn-loaded bookshelf and center speakers. Uh, those are in this price range. The prices listed on their site are for individual speakers. So it's just north of $300 a pair for the bookshelf and the center. Uh, but then they also have the matching in-wall speakers, which are exactly $300 a pair. So we're right into that price range. Uh, this is one where if you did want to do something either high up on the wall or upward firing, either option, then I think getting Klipsch's uh, upward firing Atmos modules uh, totally works in this instance because they have a switch on them. So you can either use them mounted to the wall or ceiling or flick the switch and use them upward firing. So you could actually give it a try. And similar horn-loaded design to the HSUs. Now, normally they cost a lot more. Normally they're up to like $600 a pair. If you go back a couple of years, um, they had a model called the RP140 SA. Now it's the RP500 SA. But the 140 SAs are still out there on Amazon for $300 a pair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sound-wise, there's no difference between the 140 SA and the 500 SA. It was just the cosmetics that changed to keep them updated with the current reference Premiere line. So uh, I actually kind of like the HSU plus Klipsch solution in this instance. Uh, something is telling me that he might be looking for a little bit higher efficiency since he was looking at Yamo and that. Uh, but that might have been purely price point. I don't know. Uh, but to me, that's where I would point you. Those are the two options I got. I don't know if Tom has a separate suggestion from those. I don't. I, I was looking around while you were talking. Everything I was looking at was more expensive. Though. Yeah. It's getting tough. Prices have gone up on everything. It's yeah. not great. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. I don't have a better suggestion. Uh, yeah, because I was looking at uh, SVS and Aperion and stuff like <laughs> that. SVS is definitely more expensive now. Aperion doesn't have the Intimus yeah. line anymore. Novus is their entry level, and that's not cheap. So. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I was even the satellite, the prime satellites are not that bad, but they're not that big either. So, right. you know, you could live with them for a little while, but then you're going to end up having to buy the bigger bookshelves for the fronts mm -hmm. and then the larger center, which is quite a bit more than the yeah. price point you're looking at. Derek has a Marantz SR6014 receiver, can process 11 speakers, but only has nine amps built in. What's a good two channel amp for running the? extra pair i mean yeah. we've talked about the fossey amp a thousand times we we've sure has the, that's the fossey the dayton amp tda 7498e that model number that i always have to look at because i can't remember it's 75 dollars on amazon uh they they spec it at 160 watts but that's into four ohms with 10 percent total harmonic distortion <laughs> so the okay. real amount is like somewhere between 50 and 60 watts which is perfectly fine for running your rear heights Right. Uh, class D amplifier, that Fosse TDA 749080. I, that's that's probably where I would stop this journey, to be honest, because everything else is more expensive. But yeah, um, uh, you mentioned which one? The Dayton next? Is that one the one that you mentioned? Dayton was the second. Yeah, that's what yeah. I have, right? Uh, well, you've got the APA 100, which doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, that but. used to be class AB. So the current is the APA 102 BT because it's got Bluetooth built in. $155 over at Parts Express. That's two times 60 watts, class D amplifier. If you want to stick with class AB, uh, there still is the audio source amp 100. That's $150. So really close, uh, two times 50 watts class AB, if you really want to stick with that. Uh, and then Outdoor Speaker Depot, they've got a model that I would probably swear up and down is just the Dayton in a different case ever so slightly because they're real similar to each other. But the, the Outdoor Speaker Depot version of it goes for 140 bucks. They rated it two times 50 watts, class D. So uh, all of those perfectly reasonable can get the job done. But the Fosse costs half as much as the others and has equal amounts of power and sounds good and runs nice and cool and is small and easy to position somewhere. So uh, I like the Fosse. All right, there you go. Uh, David who's apparently now in Japan. Yes. Back in March, David wrote us to, uh, when he learned he would be moving to Japan and, now, and needed to downsize. Well, he's been there for about three months now, and he only sold off one AV receiver before the move. I guess he had more than one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So now it's really time to downsize, but now he's in Japan. So I don't know how he's going to do that. But first, he discovered the joy of Japanese thrift stores. You can't help but say this place has everything. Super cheap desktop speakers right next to gigantic $12,000 towers. Massive pure Class A amplifiers next to compact uh, Class D models next to tube amps. Tone arms for any turntable imaginable. It's all here for him. It was amazing. So he's in a place that's about 1,400 square feet total. And the, the rooms aren't that big. This is Japan, after mm -hmm. all. And he's got his RBH661 SE speakers. And they are not small. That's an American-made speaker made for American homes. <laughs> he's enamored. Uh, wait a second. Uh, he came across some Kef LS50s for about $700 a pair at these thrift, thrift stores. He's enamored by their looks. So do we think they'd be an upgrade in terms of sound quality or a la lateral move or a downgrade? Um, let me look at oh, the 660s. Ooh. Yeah. No, I mean, objectively, the Kef LS50s do not play as loud. Yeah. But he clearly well, I mean, doesn't need that. He doesn't need that right now. <laughs> but the, yeah. I, wow. Yeah, I, I know. Would say it would, it, I would say, I would guess, I would hope it would be a lateral move and right. would think it might be a slight downgrade. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, sound thinking, quality. I'm not thinking upgrade. No. I'm thinking... Quite possibly uh, perceptible differences, and then that yeah. becomes subjective. Do you prefer right. the differences, or do you prefer what you already have? So that is a bit tough. Um, yeah, I'm not I, thinking that's an upgrade. That that just doesn't come into my mind. That uh, LS50s are a clear. You might upgrade. consider them an upgrade, considering you that might. you're going to be. You might. You're going to be saving a ton of space well and not only <laughs> like, that like when you're in the smaller space the ls50s are going to be much easier to position ideally right. so just from that alone they very well might sound better simply because you weren't able to possession the big rph speakers where they really would be optimal so right. um my my instinct is to say like in a generalized what type of level of sound quality do these produce I'm thinking it's more like a lateral move. I'm thinking there might be some differences, subjectively maybe some plus and minuses to you on a personal level. They definitely do not play as loud, but I don't see that as a as a problem in this instance. Um, yeah, that that's where I would land on it. I don't I don't like I wouldn't come at this and go, oh, you're going to be super disappointed going no, from I those RPGs to the LS50s. It's, I it's, wouldn't think yeah. that. Yeah, I, if I'm it's a downgrade, boat. it's a small one. I don't. I, yeah, yeah. 
and I think it might be very dependent on the space that you're in yeah, too. I mean, yeah, if you yeah, yeah. have a well-treated space, meaning you got lots of you know uh, room treatments and you know not a lot of hard reflective surfaces, the RBHs might sound better. Mm. And then you get the kefs into a more reflective space, and you know the concentric driver and everything else mm-hmm. might sound slightly better than the <laughs> RBHs. Uh, I would guess. I mean, I I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, do they have return policies at these thrift right. stores? I'm guessing not. Seven hundred dollars seems like a really good deal for that those is a good deal. 50s. That's less I than mean, half I, price I, from when they were selling I would, you. I would, I would be wanting to pick them up for that reason alone right. if I had seven dollars lying around. Junior in Montreal, he has got apparently a billion questions, so I'm real excited about this. Maybe we should save this one for somebody else. <laughs> Junior is going to renovate and finish his basement. It will have seven foot ceilings throughout. There's already one room with finished walls down there, eleven feet by sixteen foot nine inches which will end up being the home theater 11 by 16 9 almost 17 just think 11 by 17 basically a little shorter than 17 the rest of the renovation will create two bedrooms i don't care about the rest of that he sent a diagram uh with some photos that end up being the theater room there's a movie room it has a it has an enclosed door and what will be the back right corner yep It'll be uh, to one side of it. It'll be party to the laundry room and where the stairs and the entrance to the basement are. Uh, on the other party wall, because it's in a corner, so two of the walls are exterior walls. The uh, the other party wall will go to a storage area and sort of like a central area in the basement to get to all the other rooms. So the two bedrooms, neither of the bedrooms shares a physical wall with the theater. That's going to come yeah. up later. So there is all a right. little bit of a buffer between the movie room and the two bedrooms. So Junior's father-in-law will be staying in one of the bedrooms, so soundproofing is a concern when it comes to the theater. He's been researching and spoken with a few contractors. Everyone seems to have a different approach. He's hoping we can help him decide on the best plan. Yeah, uh, I feel your pain, don't, dude. Don't let your father-in-law move in. That's the best plan. No, that's, you, that is going to happen. There are, there are th- circumstances that make it very understandable. As far as construction from soundproofing uh, the theater room, what do we recommend? He's heard yay and nay on rock wool from it's the way to go to it's a waste of money. Yay and yay on mass loaded vinyl, resilient channels, and sonopan. We're actually the best way to address it all. Well, this is a soundproofing company question, and it they can sure absolutely is. walk you through everything from we can make it into you literally cannot hear sounds on the other side of the door Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to um, we will make it so that your father-in-law will probably not be disturbed as long as you don't turn it up too loud. Sure. Um, Generally speaking, just from the things that you said before, I mean, mass lid vinyl, uh, rock wool, resilient channels. I don't know what some of the pan is. I don't remember that. But, uh, you know, the one, what you're, those, like rock wool in particular is just insulation, right? So insulation is usually not great for just soundproofing except that, that you can put it in the walls and it'll help you know sound transmission directly through the it's walls making but sure that the bays of the walls don't become resonating chambers that's really all we want the but you don't need rock wool for, for that you can put anything in there you can yep. put the cheap stuff in you there can put so the cheap stuff. there there are things that you can do this like i said the soundproofing company will walk you through this but we've talked about it a whole bunch if this were my room mm-hmm. these are the things i would do Okay. First, I would uh, make sure that I had two layers of drywall everywhere, which is going okay. to gonna, gonna, so going like, to increase your cost. If we just look inside of what will become the movie room, uh, it's got a laminate floor, it's got drywall walls, but it has no ceiling. Now, I'm assuming, because especially when we start looking at how there are wires hanging down below the joists... Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was done professionally. That kind of looks like maybe that was the previous homeowner that strung these things along because that does not look like proper wiring at all. Uh, And clearly, since they put the walls up before the ceiling, they must have been thinking that they were going to install a drop tile ceiling if they were going to finish the ceiling at all. Maybe they just figured they were going to leave the ceiling open. With a seven-foot ceiling, they were going to put a drop tile in here? Man, you're going to bump your head on that. But there's no other... Like, this is not how you drywall the ceiling. Uh, You're absolutely right. I mean, I'm looking at these things that they've they've just tacked them up to the cross beams and, like, I mean, on got, the bottom. You they've can't got a wire that like them. dips down under a joist and comes back up and things <laughs> that are just strung places. along. I mean, you could you could put soffits to hide the ones that are along the perimeter of the room, but some of these are out into the middle of the room where they're dropping down below the joist. So the my instinct is to tell you, first and foremost, sort out the wiring because I don't like that. I, I don't no. like what's going on there with the wiring in this space. And if the rest of the basement is all being renovated anyway, like now's the time to do it. Get that wiring yeah. sorted out and get that proper. That That's my number one advice. Second, if we are talking about soundproofing, 
you can't just think, okay, I'm worried about the bedroom that's also in the basement. So as long as I soundproof the wall, that's going to be fine. Nah, the ceiling counts too. Because if the sound yeah. gets up into those joists that are in the ceiling, I mean, those are connected to the bedrooms. It goes along the joist bays. So you can't just ignore the ceiling and think, oh, all I have to worry about are the walls. So like... I'm a fan of a drop tile ceiling, but not when the ceiling height is already seven feet and it isn't the greatest solution for soundproofing. It's very convenient for being able to run things above the drop tile ceiling and there are ways to make it reasonably soundproof. But if you want to do this right and you're concerned about soundproofing, that needs to be a proper finished ceiling, at least inside of the theater room. So you got to sort out the wiring and then... Um, like you don't necessarily have to take down all the drywall. I mean, the proper way to do a drywall ceiling is you put the drywall on the ceiling first and then you put the drywall for the walls in there because the walls actually hold the ceiling at the edges a little bit. But you're probably going to want to fill all that, the gap between the walls and the ceiling with um, like acoustic sealant or acoustic caulk that doesn't fully harden anyway. So the way that I would approach this, the ceiling it will be drywall. That I would use resilient channel. Separate what the drywall is physically screwed into from the existing joists. So for the ceiling, drywall ceiling on resilient channel, you're going to have to level what the drywall attaches to anyway. So instead of furring strips, resilient channel. If you want to go further, then the solution is two layers of drywall with green glue in between. So that's where you're going to want to talk to the soundproofing company and figure out exactly what level of soundproofing you really need, because just decoupling the drywall does quite a bit. And then if all those joist bays are filled with cheap insulation, you're doing pretty good. But if you need this to be, I can play a movie at close to reference volume while my father-in-law is sleeping in the bedroom, then you're going to want to do two layers of drywall with green glue in between. You're going to need all four parts of soundproofing that Soundproofing Company talks about. That's the ceiling. On the walls, you can leave the drywall that's there. You're going to need to trim it down a little bit and then fill uh, in the edges. I don't know about that. You're going to well, have to you're going to have to worry about any outlets that are on those walls too. And yeah, there's probably but no I'm insulation that, like, the behind rest, those walls. The rest of this basement is unfinished. So I'm thinking you can actually access the backs of the theater room walls. What's going to become the laundry room and the storage what, I mean, room? We don't know. We, we don't know hope, for sure, yes. but he's he said the rest of the basement is unfinished. So if you can if you can access the backs of those walls, um, yeah, then you can put the putty, the acoustic putty that goes You can around. put the putty yeah. around the existing outlets. You can make sure all that's sealed. And if you are going for really high-grade soundproofing, you can put a second layer of drywall with green glue over the existing drywall that's on the walls. And that's all okay. Then, on the other side, on the laundry room side, on the storage room side, you're actually going to want to extend the base plates, because I'm assuming it's 2 by 4 construction. You're going to want to extend the base plates a little bit and put in some staggered studs, because you do not want the drywall that's on the laundry room side and the storage room side to share the same studs as the drywall that's on the theater room side. And all the talk about sound clips and hat channels or resilient channel to separate the drywall on the walls... We've had way too many people, even soundproofing company now is saying, you know what, just do staggered studs because every contractor knows how to do staggered studs. It's more secure. You can still hang things on the walls. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's easier, and it's still very effective. It's just get away from the drywall on the laundry side and the storage side being attached to the same studs as the theater side. So staggered studs. That can impact what insulation you end up putting in the walls because you can do it cheap. You can do the pink stuff or even the, the yellow or the white stuff and just kind of work it in there in between the staggered studs but if you can do the blown in cellulose so much the better because that'll get into all the nooks and crannies and it'll get around all of those staggered studs and give you a nice proper fill and uh, the blown in cellulose or the blown in uh, eco-friendly one that's shredded up blue jeans that's a great solution in these cases so that's how i would handle the soundproofing i mean talk to soundproofing company but now you're armed with some knowledge to ask them more leading questions and see if they agree with the suggestions that we've given. Yeah. So what I was saying was I would make sure that I put the, that all, every one of the outlets that were on the, the walls, the shared walls, because yeah. the outside wall is already going to be insulated in some way. It has to be because it's the, the exterior, exterior walls, you mean yeah. exterior wall. So yeah. you, I want insulation on the inside walls, which yeah. is unusual. So yeah. if you don't have access to the back, of these things, you're going to have to get into drywall somehow. Yeah. Uh, you also want to have access to your outlets so that you can put the acoustic putty around it mm -hmm. to make sure that the sound doesn't transmit that way. Fill all the bays in the in the ceiling, and then 
uh, two layers of drywall everywhere would be the minimum that I would probably do. Okay. Now, whether and or not you, and that's instead of doing the the hat channels and all that, I would also yeah. do a solid core door. Um, sure. You're going to have sound transmission out of this room. That's just that's just what's going to happen. But you what can you quiet it, to, it down a lot. <laughs> well, and what you what you don't want it to do is to get down the hall and also rattle your, right. you know, what's going on in the the bedrooms down the hall yeah. and. It probably means that you will have to turn it down at night, no matter what, you know, okay. or when your father-in-law is sleeping. Uh, but you can get awfully close for not that much extra money. Yeah, and it can be uh, a lot more muffled than just your standard two by four wall dry, single layer of drywall on both sides. Yes, you can do a lot no, better than nothing that. Else, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. do a lot better than that. So the house has central uh, HVAC system. There is one vent in the ceiling in the theater room. Can you keep that while still having adequate soundproofing? Uh, you well, I mean, you gotta keep it because <laughs> you want to have heat and air coming through this place. Um, the yeah, uh, we can't see it, can we? Uh, generally no, speaking, it's not you want in... like a flexible vent of some sort. Like you want a tube, the tube that that feeds the air into your home theater mm -hmm. to be flexible and to yeah. bend. Yeah. So the more bends and the more the flex, so extra long. Just think of it that way, and then it. <laughs> It's gonna and, do and a talk bunch to of your bands. to your HVAC person because I imagine there's gonna be some HVAC work when you're renovating the entire basement. So talk to them a little about it because you can end up putting an extra strain on your furnace and your air conditioner if you go overboard with the number of bends. So talk right. it out with them. But the point is, some part. I mean, you can even do the thing where if it's I imagine solid duct going to the air vent that goes into the theater right now. You can even do it where it's just a flexible coupler. So that it's not a continuous solid piece, that at least some part of it has a flexible joint in it. Uh, and even that, I mean, it, it stop, what it does is it, it uh, damps a lot of the mechanical vibration that's coming from the theater going into that vent. It hits that soft coupler and a lot of it gets damped and that's what we want to do. So you don't necessarily have to go overboard, talk that over with your HVAC specialist. Uh, but yeah, if you can do the flexible duct and have a few bends in it without overloading the burden on your furnace and your air conditioner, uh, then that tends to work the best. It's all about damping the physical vibrations from getting to the rest of your ducting. Should any of the other rooms that are going to be constructed be soundproofed? He's mainly thinking about potentially soundproofing his father-in-law's bedroom, which is sounding more and more like a prison cell as we go on with this. <laughs> um, I wouldn't bother, to be honest with you. I mean, you could theoretically do it if you're really, really worried about that one room. Mm -hmm. But if if... You know, if sound is transmitting through the, the the structure of your home into that room, right? It's really not going to make that much difference. You could put. I mean, I think if you was really worried about it, I might put a solid core door on that room as sure. well, just in. Just... And I mean, you you could like instead of doing two layers of drywall and green glue in the bedroom, since that room is being constructed wholly, nothing is constructed on the bedrooms yet. You could do staggered stud. Um, you know, that doesn't take up a tremendous amount of extra floor space. You could do staggered stud, just single layer of drywall on either side, but now the two layers of drywall are not joined to the same studs. You could do that one step and then have insulation in that wall as well. That's not going crazy overboard, uh, but it would make a difference. So to me, that's where I would land on the bedroom. Um, I, I think that's sort of a reasonable amount of additional construction that goes well beyond what a normal, you know, room being thrown up would be like, where it's two by four frame and uh, and no insulation in the walls. I think just a little insulation and a staggered stud. I think that that would probably be worth it without costing a ton extra. Hmm. Okay. Oh, we should have mentioned on that HVAC thing, I'm assuming the air return is just the gap under the door. So I, I'm thinking you're not going to be able to seal like, air seal the home theater still a solid core door but i'm imagining you're still going to have to keep some amount of gap under the door because i just i don't think this has a dedicated air return out of the theater right so uh, just be mindful of that again talk to your hvac person right should any of the other room oh wait, 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 wait. his wife would prefer to keep laminate flooring but junior would like to carpet the theater room what would be best carpet <laughs> i mean Fun. i guess it's not entirely not like you to put a rug down you know, if you're going to have other acoustic treatments in here, I, I don't think and, you have to replace the laminate. Or I guess you could go over the laminate. There's carpets I mean, that would, can go over existing flooring. Would, so maybe that's yeah. the best solution. 
if we go up with if we end up with carpet what kind of carpet is the best for the theater room it's really more about the pad i mean yeah. the carpet <laughs> itself is not really all that important it's about how thick of a pad you can get underneath. that's true yeah um so i don't think i would worry about that uh I'm not a huge fan of laminate flooring, like full stop. Uh, so it is a basement, you, though, so I, right. I get that. Now, I understand why you might want to do it. Uh, at the very least, if you're going to go laminate flooring down there, I would consider get. I mean, I would insist, like, so laminate flooring has an underlayment that you have mm -hmm. to do, like, a, and the more expensive stuff is, it, it, first of all, it gives the floor the the correct sound like the, okay. the the early laminate when people were installing laminate in their homes when it first became popular they would put this cheap stuff underneath where that's where you got that kind of smack sound as you walk <laughs> through somebody's house and it sounded like you're walking on plastic ah. the, the the more expensive stuff is better and it will give you you know that it, it, you will not be able to tell as readily that it's laminate mm. flooring you should do that guarantee but if I mean, you're gonna, the thing uh, is, the floor is already there, so I think the idea was it just saves cost and not tear up right. what's already there. I think that's the sort of part of the but idea. If you could put carpet on top of this laminate yeah. and then take it out afterwards, or like Rob said, you can get a, a rug and put some sort of pad underneath the yeah. rug in order to to make it absorb sound a little bit better. I'm but not a huge carpet in, of some sort. Yeah, I'm not huge into tearing up what's there and then going wall to wall carpet in a basement. I'm not I'm not a huge fan of that. So I think if you can either do a rug with a nice pad under it and it almost goes wall to wall or you get the proper type of carpet that can go over an existing finished floor. I, I that's where I would land on it. Uh I gotta scroll. Uh, okay. Switching to plans for inside the theater itself, he already owns an Anthem MRX740 receiver, which has built in uh, seven built-in amps. It can process up to 11 speakers, plus an Emotiva XBA5 Gen 2 amplifier. He's got a, he's apparently not been listening to this podcast for very long. <laughs> he's got a pair of Paradigm Monitors 11 V7 towers, uh, Center 3 V7, and a Surround 1 bipoles, and a pair of SVS Prime Elevations. That's when he started listening to us. Plus <laughs> with a <laughs> single SVS PB1000 Pro sub. He liked to keep those while expanding the system to 7.2.4. So the diagram of his proposed layout. You can. I will already tell you up front, I do not think you need surround back speakers. Let's just... <laughs> I will already tell you that I don't think you should go 7 point, 7 point anything. You want two rows of seats in a 17-foot room. I just... I, yeah, I'm, I've got a I whole just, general idea on this that's going to uh, come up. Yeah, I, I would do two. I would do two side surrounds and no surround backs. All right, he has his front row a little less than nine feet from the front row, front, front wall, with the room being uh, seventeen feet long and eleven feet wide, which is kind of the way we, we thought. We put his door at the back right corner on the right wall. Well, his no, he's got it in the front left. That's where that's where he's got it in his diagram. What? Why? That's that. Look at the diagram. It's right there, man. I don't know why. That's one of my other thoughts, but we'll get into all of it. I would not put the door there. <laughs> oh, flip this 180 degrees, first of all. Okay. First question is, what's the biggest screen? Oh, my God. <laughs> what's the biggest screen you can put in the 11-foot wall? Because he says he would love 120 inches, but then we leave him by the foot on either side, which would force his tower speakers right up against the side walls. Plus, with this proposed layout, the door to his theater is on the left wall near the front of the room don't do that right beside where his front left tower would go which would knock it over every time somebody comes in the room the door will swing outward oh that's right it swings outward so no but it would still mean bumping into a tower when you're using the door whether we suggest 180 degrees number one so number two why are you this is the same thing so many people do and I'm, i've written an article about it or maybe i haven't <laughs> yet but uh why i think it's t even titled why you shouldn't buy the biggest screen possible <laughs> because there are just so many things that can go wrong with looking at the size of your wall and saying this is how big a screen will fit right. and then buying that and you in know, his current plan he's under nine feet away in the front row so 120 inches from nine feet how do you feel about owning stock in dramamine because you're <laughs> gonna need it when you're sitting up nine feet from no, 120 i, mean, I will screen. say you can get a good idea of what type of screen you actually want because I mean, even forgetting our thing of go to a theater and count the ceiling tiles and then count the uh, the width across the screen, uh, you know, the tiles going across the screen, for, forget that. When you go to the theater, where do you like to sit? Do you like to sit at the prime two-thirds from the front wall 
uh, in from the theater. If that's so, then really what you want is a 45 degree field of view. A lot of people actually like to come in and sit close to the back of the theater. That's what they like, in which case those people actually want less than a 45 degree field of view. They want something between 35 and 40 degrees in all case. Yeah. Now, some people go, no, I like to sit within the front half of the theater. I don't know very many people who their preferred seat is the front row of the theater. <laughs> that's that's pretty unusual. You usually only go there when there's no other seats available. But uh, if you're one of the people who's like, no, I actually like to sit maybe halfway into the theater or within the front half of the theater, okay, you're the type of person who actually genuinely likes a 50 to 60 degree field of view. So answer that question first, because if you're just going, yeah, I want to cover my whole wall if I can, you might be thinking that's what you like, but Go back and think, where do you prefer to sit in the theater? And that gives you some indications. And if you're, yeah, if you're one of those people who likes to sit in the front half, okay, that's fine. Uh, we'll try to get you there. But I want to, because I mean, all the other questions are coming up. They're all to do with this layout and all to do with this plan and everything like that. I want to question, do you actually need six seats? Uh, it sounds like he's going to have at least four people in his household. Is four enough? Because if four is enough, I'm actually thinking... So if you have to have six seats and you have to do two rows of seating, then I completely agree with Tom. We're going to flip this entire theater 180 degrees. The door is going to be in the rear right, not the front left. And you could actually shift the back row of seats closer to the left wall so that you have more space when you come in through the door. The back row doesn't have to be perfectly centered. Okay, the one person sitting in the very back left chair, they're not getting the optimal experience, but boo-hoo, we have to live in the real world and actually have a way of getting in and out of this room instead of bumping into a tower speaker or immediately tripping over a chair so if that's the way it's going to be flip 180 and move the back row close to the left wall but i'm wondering if four seats is enough maybe we turn this theater 90 degrees and we make it wider than it is long hmm. because then you can definitely stop at five speakers there's no need for surround backs you wouldn't even want them because you're not going to have the room behind it you can have a more optimal viewing distance you're not going to have your front row of seats smack dab in the middle of the room for acoustic issues because that's where they are right now um and then like all of what i'm getting at is if you are the person who wants to sit within the front half of the theater you can have the bigger screen size and still have adequate space to the left and right of the screen for your speakers if this room is wider than it is long and if you want all theater recliners four of those in a curved row can fit really nicely into right. a 16 foot wide and have a nice very nearly three feet on either side of that row of yeah, four 11 seats. feet is very very narrow most couches it's these narrow. day are around they for even three seater couches without the arms in between yeah are looking at 10 feet yeah. Uh, so if you really do have six people in this household and you're all going to be in the theater at the same time and you know that's the use case, I don't have a problem with that. Flip the thing 180 degrees. We can work with that. But if it, it sound, in his email, it sounded like there's four people and maybe he's thinking, oh, there's going to be visitors. But I'm like, are all four of you plus visit? Like, you know, you can bring in some seats that go in front or, you know, go into the rear corners or something like that, some bar stools. So if it's most, if four will do you, I would actually consider making this room wider than it is long and, and doing four seats across. Well, let's not even talk about the fact that you absolutely do not need towers in this room. <laughs> it's just even, what he already has. It's so. what you got. Yeah. So I'll let you, let, I'll let you go on that one. But yeah, that's not what you need. Um, yeah. From nine feet away, from the front wall, I would be thinking a hundred inches would be about as big as. Well, that I mean, that's the forty-five degree angle. That's what I would yeah. go from from yeah. that distance. But if yeah. if you know you like the much bigger screen, then if you flip it ninety degrees, you can have it without it being a problem for everything yeah. else. I actually like doing it the longer way. The, the with the second thing Rob suggested. Either way, you still don't end up with surround back speakers. No matter that's how right. you look at it, we're not going to suggest surround back <laughs> speakers. Uh, it does look like he's 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 got like bipole speakers for his he does that's what he already has the surround ones yeah. are bipoles yeah yeah so in this plan he has two rows of seats three recliners in each row he'd like a riser for the second row but the ceiling is already low at seven feet so he's concerned about that plus if the projector is mounted at the back he's worried anyone in the back row might bump their heads into it or at the very least cast a shadow you're gonna get shadows like you can't stand <laughs> up in this room and not get a shadow that's right. just going to be the that's the case in my theater yeah you're gonna to have to get used to that so if you don't want shadows then you don't want a projector <laughs> should he consider an ultra short throw projection set up instead or perhaps a regular short throw projector that could be mounted above the front row of seats yeah one okay. that you know only has like an eight foot throw instead of an I, 11 okay foot throw. so the ultra short throw you could do up yeah. front you still need it to be two or three uh feet from the wall uh 
and it would put you within range of this hundred and hundred to one twenty. Yeah, uh, they, and they actually, usually... if you do the idea of flipping this ninety right. degrees, uh, you're kind of going to have to um, <laughs> because if you right. want that, if you want that screen size. Um, with this theater being wider than it is long as I'm proposing you might be able to do, then you actually kind of need to go ultra short. They're like, again, the whole idea with that arrangement is four seats is enough and you want the bigger screen size. Because if you're okay with the 100 inch screen size, which is actually what we would recommend for the seating distances that you're talking about, if you figure out, actually, I do like to sit two thirds of the way into the movie theater when I go, then you want a 100 inch screen size and all of this can work with the longer than it is wide setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could go with a Epson 50 and you could put a shelf across the back because he's got some space behind that back row of seats. You could put a shelf that goes across there and the projector sits on the shelf and that way if they're going to hit their head on the projector, they're going to hit their head on the shelf, you know, instead of it right. being a ceiling mounted projector. So you can you can manage things that way. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I'm not in love with the idea of a riser in the back of this room either with a seven yeah, foot Yeah, I probably wouldn't go for it. I probably uh, wouldn't go for it. I, I would maybe consider getting some of those furniture leg riser thingies that we've seen people or use before. Or most of the recliner sellers, they actually do offer just a taller option. They yeah. just they just build it a, and a little bit extra taller. I would consider that. It just more means than a riser. that the the people in the back row aren't going to be are either going to force the people in the front row to recline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you know which most people would anyways. But you know or, I mean uh, mount mount the in this room screen, mount, mount high, the screen yeah. right up high mount it. I mean it's a seven foot ceiling so mount it right up against the ceiling because if you're in a recliner that's not bad. It's not going to strain your neck to look up to no, the, no. the top of the screen at seven feet. That's not a problem. So no. you know I, I think. It can work. Uh, so it mostly comes down to this. If you're good with a 100 inch screen size, then go the longer than wide and you can do all the things you're talking about. And I would just build a shelf across the entire back. That's the depth of the projector. <laughs> and I'd build it all the way across the back so that that shelf is right there and nobody's, if they're going to hit their head, they're going to hit it on the shelf. Uh, but if you, if you were like, no, I want that bigger screen size, then I will say go ultra short throw and turn this room 90 degrees. So would it be worth going to six overhead speakers instead of four since nope. he wants two rows of seats? No. <laughs> nah, don't do it. I mean, he's talking about going to a whole new uh, processor in order to do that. I know, that. at you, that point. Yeah. You already got you this got anthem? Nah, just, no. If you're doing that, then you have to sell the tower speakers too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to have to sell your receiver and everything, then I would, yeah, you got to buy that. You got to do that as well. So should he put the equipment rack outside the theater room to free up some space? Would that mess up the soundproofing by requiring openings for all the wires to go? You already have wires going into your theater. They're called power outlets, but sure. whatever. Would that mess up the soundproofing by requiring openings for the wires to go in the theater? Would it be better just to have the long equipment stand below the screen? Well, if you have a ultra, if you go with the ultra short throw, you're yeah. going to need a stand anyway. Yeah. So, you know. And it makes no sense to run everything out of the room when it could be right there under the projector if it's right. the ultra short throw. So that one, to me, I would definitely have it inside in a stand I mean, honestly, below the screen. Honestly, if you do the thing that Rob suggested, which is put a shelf that goes along the whole back of mm -hmm. your the theater you could just put all your gear up there including the projector and i mean yeah you know, in that scenario we also have the screen up high on the front wall so you have lots of space below the screen too so i'm leaning the stuff is inside the room yeah i would think so you got lots of places you could put it uh th that said if you really want to run it outside your room it's just like all the other outlets that we've been talking about you know you would right. just make sure that you put putty around the yeah. the outlet box so since the room is narrow, should he keep his paradigm surround one speakers or go with for in-wall surrounds? Does it make sense to position the bipole surround ones in between his two rows of seats as shown in this plan? I don't like doing the bipoles in general. So um, if you're willing to get rid of them and sell them and get something else, uh, I would either, like we've talked about, two sets of side surrounds if you want two rows mm. of seats or... Uh, you could continue to use your bipoles in the if you use the ninety degree turn that Rob was talking about. Yeah, uh, you could continue to use them in that orientation. I'll be honest; I've used them in I've used you know the, the direct monopole you know and mm -hmm. bipole speakers, and I think that the monopoles sound slightly better. They they're more you're easier to locate them when they're doing you know pinpoint sounds that are supposed to be coming from behind you uh, or to the sides of you in this mm -hmm. case. Uh, but it's not so much that I'm like, you have to sell your bipoles to, to 
get monopoles. I actually sort of feel like when you're going to be really close to the side walls, if you do the longer than wide, you're going to be close to the side walls. That having a slightly more diffuse speaker has some benefit. He's close to the side walls no matter what. He is, but I mean, if you turn it 90 (laughs) degrees, you got at least three feet to the side walls. So that's not quite as bad. Not quite as bad, Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean... I'm perfectly fine with the plan that he's got in place, except that he does not have enough of a walkway, but we're going to address that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to demand that you sell them. I, I would actually probably still just use them because they mount easily on the side walls. But uh, I, st- I kind of like the 90 degree turn better myself. Yeah. And then I would keep them too. All right. So what about surround backs? He asked, should you get another pair of surround one? I don't think you should do surround backs full stop. <laughs> Either one of your configuration. In this instance, I kind of agree. Yeah, it's going to be an yeah. unpleasant experience for that back row if if you do the two rows. And if you yeah. turn to 90 degrees, you really don't need them. Yeah. Uh, I'm So I'm going to skip it. Yeah. Uh, should you get a second pair of uh, SVS prime elevation speakers with this low ceiling? Are prime elevations the right choice? Or should you get something else that would make Atmos more effective? As far as more effective, I don't know that you're going to get anything that's going to make Atmos really that much more effective. Uh, because I don't really think that most is that effective as I begin with, but <laughs> a seven foot ceiling and it's open, mm-hmm. there's no world in which I put SVS prime elevation speakers up there. I I sell them or put them in a different room or oh, really? use them in a different different place. No, I just get some in ceiling speakers and install them in the new ceiling that you're going to be putting up there. I would nice and flush mount and yeah, I just get some of those Monoprice Alpha series or whatever uh, the ones are that we suggest. Okay. Just because I think I, I just there's not enough. See, you know, I'm not that tall. I'm five seven. Mm-hmm. I'm not that tall of a man, but I don't like walking through rooms that are this short with pointy speakers with stuff dangling down, down yeah. from them. I just don't I like was it. sort of thinking that maybe they could like actually go on the front wall right up against the ceiling and if we're going to have this shelf but along the back wall, they go up there as rear heights. They could. You could do it that way, but then on you're the looking shelf. at uh you know, again, he's going to have a screen that's going to be almost flush mounted to the ceiling, so right. they'll have to be on the outside of the screen well, to yeah. begin with, which is fine. Yeah. But uh yeah, I mean if you if you did that, you could do it that way. I I I guess you could go either way. If it were me, yeah. I would probably look. I'd be okay with the front height, rear heights. I don't disagree that if you if you want to do what he's shown in his diagram, I, I wouldn't mount the prime elevations where he's drawn them in the diagram. If that's what you want to do, I would go in ceilings. So he's planning on getting a second PB1000 Pro, but should he upgrade to dual PB2000 Pros, would they improve the experience? Are you going to sit on them? Because that's the way that they fit in this room, in case you're wondering. Uh, right. In fact, Rob's way of turning this this system so that it's 90 degrees uh-huh. gives you the best chance of being able to place two subwoofers in yeah. here. Full stop. Yeah. Like, just full stop. You have... I, I don't really see you getting a second subwoofer in here. If you wanted to go to the 2000 series, which you absolutely do not need to do for this room. Nah, don't do that. <laughs> don't absolutely do that. don't need to do. I would Unless go with the going cylinders. To the yeah. Well, yeah. So sealed. I actually think you could have gone sealed as well in here. I mean, the, I don't really think that the 1000 Pro, the 1000 SB 1000s would have struggled too hard in this room. No. It's not that. It's just not that big of a room. No, but, I, uh, I, I would be perfectly happy with SB 2000 Pros in here. Yeah. I would be perfectly happy with that if you want to downsize. Uh, but if the idea is you want to spend as little as possible, there is no reason in this room why you need to go beyond PB 1000 Pros. Right. Yeah. And, you know. Yes. For the seats, he really likes the looks of the Valencia Tuscany recliners, but with a row of three with arms in between each seat being 99 inches wide. He'd only have 16 and a half inches on either side. Is that enough for a walkway? <laughs> no. I don't know, dude. How fat's your family supposed? Is everybody like, like dainty? <laughs> with the surround speakers and the walls uh, and the walls end up being a problem. All the surround speakers on the walls end up being a problem. Yes. Should yeah. you consider something else? Um, if you're yeah, going to you do the the uh, the uh, longer than it is wide and you're going to do two rows of three seats each, you've got to go narrower than this. Um, that, uh, I, yeah, <laughs> you've got to go narrower than this. This is not a great plan. Now, like I say, if you turn to 90 degrees and you're actually going to have four four seats, then doing this with, you know, love seat in the middle, uh, middle with uh, two seats on either side and having that as the curved row, that could totally work. I actually, um, like I know Valencia is super popular right now. Um, I would strongly consider um, going over to HT Market because they have 
um, a model called, uh, let's see, the Waveland that looks a heck of a lot. Uh, so if I switch back here in the images, we go from Valencia, Tuscany over to HD Design Waveland. It's like, those are really super similar. Those are a little bit more narrow, but there's actually some additional um, configurations that the Waveland offers that Valencia doesn't, including armless designs. So you could maybe get into a three-seat sofa instead of arms in between each. HT Market offers that Valencia. Well, Valencia can do it because they can do custom stuff. Um, but if you do the 90 degree turn and you go four seats across, there's, there's all sorts of options there. Now, I particularly like what they would call the curved love seat configuration for the four seats. So love seat in the middle and then two seats on either side with the wedge shaped arms so that the whole thing is a curve that at 130 inches wide in the Waveland from HD Design gives you the perfect width to have three feet on either side if this room is turned 90 degrees so that it's wider than it is long. Um, that, that would be sort of my preferred setup. But if this room is going to be two rows and each row is going to be three seats wide, you've got to go narrower seats. You just have to. And HD Market on, in their HD design, they have a whole bunch of different models that would allow that. I would consider going as narrow as you possibly can. That would be like the Belmont would be a good choice. So if you click through all these Valencia Tuscany home theater seating mm -hmm. pictures they have here, uh, there is one that has a three seater with only arms on the either side. Okay. So the middle seat does not have any arms. Okay. I don't know how this thing works or if you can just buy that thing mm -hmm. but you would have to talk to your wherever you're buying this from uh to see if that's a configuration you can just buy you know so basically it looks like a three seat or love seat uh so sometimes with these the middle seat won't recline because it doesn't they, have controls those ones usually do yeah they they stuff the controls down the side or they give you a yeah. wand yeah the, or yes so the person in the middle would not have a cup holder would be the issue. So yeah. if you're totally sold on getting these seats, it does look like there is a way of doing it. Yeah. It would just be the person in the middle would end up without but a like two cup feet, holder. Two feet is like the minimum for a walkway. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and again, yeah. if you, I mean, no matter what, if the room ends up being longer than it is wide, you've got to turn 180 degrees. And I would take that back row and shove it over to the left <laughs> wall just so you right. can enter and the room. And with you, you know, it, you know, like Rob said, you there are reasons why you might want to use a bipole speaker or whatever, but we're talking about very narrow walkways with very little space in between things. And uh, you end up uh, risking people bumping into stuff and all of that. Now, I have a, a pretty narrow walkway. It is, I mean, I don't know how narrow it is, but it's not super wide mm -hmm. with my couch. And I have a shelf that comes off that holds my surround speaker. And I have never hit it. Walking in the dark, you know, it probably doesn't have two feet between it and the couch. I've never, ever hit it because I know it's there. I've just never hit it. But I'm sure someone has in my family. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you're going to, if I, if you're worried about, well, I would be worried about people hitting my speaker and knocking it off the wall. Mm. I would, instead of wall mounting, I would build a shelf so the shelf gets hit ah. and not the speaker gets hit. Because <laughs> yeah. the shelf is going to stay, the speaker might not. So uh, if they damage the shelf, you can take the speaker off and then, you know, replace the shelf and put it back up there. Scott. Scott is using in-wall front speakers. So once they're installed, he can't play with their positioning. His initial plans put the front left and right speakers 10 and a half feet apart while he would be sitting 12 feet away. That would put them at plus or minus 23.6 degrees and about 20 inches away from each side wall. But he's heard so much about the equilateral triangle being ideal. If you went for that, the speakers end up being a foot uh, from each side wall. So what's best? Um, I, could, I would like to take that equilateral triangle and just throw it out. <laughs> Just yeah, I mean, uh, I, I I sort of comprehend where the whole thing came from, but that is absolutely it, it's it, it this this is this is your grandfather's <laughs> advice. Right. Like your grandfather got got and gave the advice about your speakers being equal distance from each other and from you, and it was right. for it was for you know imaging essentially. You know, it was they were trying to make sure they got perfect imaging somehow. And this was like the and I don't know why, because I see people yeah. all the time right now and they've got a uh they've got a forty five or fifty five inch T V on a stand that's barely fits it and they slam the speakers right next to it. <laughs> and then they've got a center channel between those two. Right. I'm like the the, the speakers are like six and a half inches apart from each other. Like there's only a, a tiny gap. Um yeah I would not, I would not worry about this one iota. 
I wouldn't even think twice about moving these speakers any further than that. I think right. That I mean, I, I am I am definitely not ever worried about targeting the equilateral triangle as the absolute. I don't think I don't feel like it is the ideal. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think um, it ends up being the ideal depending on where you sit. <laughs> you know, if you're well, sitting sure. a certain a certain amount from the wall that it ends up being that way. But I think it makes more sense to look at your couch and go, "This is where." <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, is the how wind. wide my speakers need to be. <laughs> There's that, so that all the seats are in between the two speakers, or at least the, the main seats that you care about. But I mean, b- by and large, I recommend following Dolby's guidelines, which is yeah. anywhere from plus or minus 22 and a half degrees to either side. So that's your 45 degree spread uh, out to plus or minus 30 degrees, which is your you know 60 degree spread, which would create an equilateral triangle. But anywhere in that range, with the notion in mind that if you have a 45 degree field of view for your display, which like we talked about, the prime seat in a movie theater, that's two thirds of the way into the theater, that delivers a 45 degree field of view. That's the sort of movie industry standard. And if that's what you have, it means your left and right speakers are just to the outside of that. (laughs) And that puts them, I mean, right about what he's talking about, about plus or minus 24 degrees, right? Instead of 22 and a half. And that gives you a really nice effect of uh, you know, when sounds are panning across the screen or they move off screen, right? They go hard pan all the way to the left or hard pan all the way to the right. That is supposed to be just off the screen. It's not supposed to be multitudes of feet away from the screen. That's not where the sound was supposed to go. Um, if you have a much smaller screen, you know, you're sitting 10 feet away from a 50 inch screen, I wouldn't slam the two speakers right to the sides of the screen. That's that's gonna look and sound weird. So I would right. stick within Dolby's guidelines, 45 degrees apart to 60 degrees apart. That's absolutely where I would stay. Um, the last time we recorded a podcast 50 years ago, uh, we talked about how, you know, some people have, love the opposite notion, right? I want all my speakers hidden behind my acoustically transparent screen, and I only ended up with a 40-degree field of view, but I still want them all there, and that ends up forcing them too close together. Right. So it can go the other way as well. If you have the big screen, like we were talking about in the last uh, question, maybe you want a 50 or a 60-degree field of view. Well, now it makes sense to have all of the speakers physically behind the screen, because again, we're just within the Dolby guidelines. So I come back to that. Now, we do have to get into the boundary effect thing a little bit. Uh, over at right. EV Gadgets, Andrew wrote up about that, and actually, it's great. He's got a table there that basically shows you, if you got this distance, this is the frequency you're kind of worried about, because it's, it's just math. We're talking about quarter wavelengths, and so if you know the distance from the speaker to the wall, either the front wall behind the speaker, if it's a freestanding speaker, or the speaker to the side wall, which is the case here, um, if you know that distance, then you can look at the table or you can quite easily calculate uh, what is the wavelength that we're going to be worried about. Now, if you have the speaker more than three feet away from any wall, well, basically the boundary effect is going to be all down into the crossover region. It's going to be in the 80 hertz region. So you can get rid of most of that just by your subwoofer to speaker integration. And we're not too worried about uh, boundary effects if the speaker is at least three feet away from all the walls, but that's not gonna be the case here. On the flip side, if the speaker is like within six inches, six to eight inches of the wall, now that boundary effect is happening at a frequency that's high enough that a simple two inch panel is gonna be sufficient to get rid of that boundary effect. So you can go with a nice, easily affordable two inch thick panel if your speaker is actually really close to the wall. But if we're talking about the sort of one to two foot range, which is very common, it would be the case here if he sticks with what he's got, 20 inches away is what he said, right? He's right in that between one and two feet range. That actually puts you into the region of frequencies where it's not low enough that it's into the subwoofer crossover, but it's not high enough that a two inch thick panel actually is effective there. That's where you want to get into the, if you're like one foot away, at least a four inch panel. But if you're in this sort of 20 inches away, you want like a six inch panel or, you know, like four inches of insulation and a two inch air gap. You actually want a nice beefy panel. And that's going to be like, this isn't the first reflection we're talking about. This is the straight to the side wall, the boundary reinforcement effect. In fact, this could go, since he's talking in wall speakers, this could go right into the corner, right? Like it's on the side wall and right into the corner, a nice six inch panel, or you know what? A corner base trap would 100%. Which which would be great, which would would want anyways. 100% be good and have benefits beyond just the speakers. So this is something that I would consider. I'm not a big fan of the, well, I've got to have the golden triangle and now they're less than, 
I mean, less than 12 inches away. Okay, you still want like a nice four inch panel in those corners. But this opens up if you keep what you have. They're a little bit closer together than that. 23.6 degrees plus or minus apart. Um, then you can have that corner free. You got 20 inches there. You can have a nice base trap in that corner and that takes care of the boundary effects and everything works out nicely. So I say stick with the distance apart that you wanted in the first place. I got no problem with that. Just make sure you base trap those corners. All right. Uh, Brandon, he says, Ooh. based on room size and physical size constraints, we recommended that Brandon get a pair of SVS PC 4000 cylinder subs. And with the prices going up, he did so just under the wire, but then he couldn't help himself and went scouring the internet to see what people were saying about those subs. And he might have led to some regret. Well, since SVS has a great return policy, well, oh. I'm, I don't care. It was mostly <laughs> just a few haters who were cross posting on all the forums. Yes, <laughs> yes we have. And I'm sure they don't, they don't either work for another company and, or they're just such huge fanboys. That's what they do. I will tell you that, uh, like having a huge fanboy for you mm. can, and, and boy meaning it's general neutral term there, <laughs> uh, having a huge fan person for you right. that goes online and posts incessantly mm. and nonstop stuff can absolutely make a business or break <laughs> it in this case. And they were talking about the PB16 Ultra, not the PC4000s, but they were describing how with the most challenging test material, there were some port chuffing. <laughs> <sighs> yep. Do we have any input about that? Can we put this one at ease? Stop reading the damn internet. Just listen to I mean, us. Also, they were doing the whole thing where they were like taking it down to one port because, you know, they care about that right. sub 10 hertz extension. So they were putting it into like maximum extension mode and then making it as loud as they possibly could. And guess what? In a subwoofer designed to work with three large ports, after you plug two of them, that single remaining port makes some noise when you drive it to maximum at 10 hertz. <gasps> Shock of shocks. Yeah. I mean, the uh, fact that it was actually producing like measurable results down there is ridiculous to begin with. This was This stuff is so out of the realm of the concern that you should have. You do not need to care about any of that is that is my input on that that is can yeah. absolutely ignore those criticisms i'm saying that you can break anything if you try hard enough sure and just because somebody did it doesn't mean that it, there's something wrong with the product like every product but you, there was also the like, super easy fix of just opening all three ports and then not trying to play below 16 hertz which it can do with all three ports open which okay the word subsonic I like, please just, if you don't believe me and you absolutely do not have to, but please just look up the definition of the word subsonic. It literally means you cannot hear it. So, this concern about getting below 20 hertz, we talked about it. Any podcast other ago. sound, yeah, like, like any other sound that you might be playing that would be uh, playing at the same time as a 10 hertz note. Right. There is no chance that you would audibly hear any port chuffing at that point. I mean, th right, it, right. there would be so much more going on. Right. So that's exactly my point. My point is, yes, you can p test a product no matter what it is. You decide what it is to the absolute extreme and show that it will break. You know that, or mm -hmm. you can show that it will somehow perform not to ma optimal. Whatever I would just ask those same people who are out there bad mouthing SVS. <laughs> Uh, hey, what subs do you use? And I guarantee you we can break those subs. I <laughs> guarantee you we can break. Not only can we break them, more than likely we can melt their voice coils and <laughs> turn them into slack, like unusable slack. They can plug two, you know, two of three ports, put right. maximum output, and make a port chuff. No. <laughs> Did the driver break? Did the amp clip? Did anything else bad happen? No but they can make a little bit of noise come out of a port. I can mm. melt down another sub that doesn't have the protections and stuff that SVS does. If anything, this is this is a, a plus. This is not a minus. <laughs> this is not a slam against them. This is like when we tried to break it, the most we could do, it's all, a, it's all about phrasing. The most we could do is make a little bit of noise come out the port. Sure. When we tried to break it. 
Yeah. When we played it in a way it was not meant to be played, in the configuration it was never meant to be played at, at volume levels it was, well, I mean, in the configuration it was, that it was never meant to play at, at these volume levels, all we could do was make it make a little bit of noise through the but ports. But Tom, if you do a DIY sub with dual 21-inch drivers, you can outperform a PP16 Ultra for less money. So it's garbage. Right. It's That's garbage, right. Tom. It's, it's raw MDF. And it has the frequency response of a of an EKG, but uh, it, you know it, it, it costs me a little bit less money. Whatever. He lastly he says we don't seem to recommend the 16 Ultra series to people very often. How come? Is it just because of size, price, no need for that much output, all of the above? Um, most of the, I mean, very rarely do we see people who actually need as much output as you get from a sub the size of mm -hmm. the 16 ultra series number one mm -hmm. it's very rare two price wise you can spend less money at other manufacturers and get similar right. performance yeah. so we often you'll often whenever we're especially we're now with this, the prices haven't gone up and pretty significantly yeah. on that 16 and ultra i mean series. people are like oh you guys are just svs fanboys we are but we're not to the <laughs> point of not recommend uh, only recommending them over everybody else Dude, so when, when we the get mono up, price monolith subs come back in stock that's uh, i'm gonna be leaning that way a lot of times now yeah because of the price the price difference yeah. uh but when you get up to this level of performance you know svs has a lot of stuff going for as far as looks and uh functionality with the apps and stuff like that and the parametric eqs and all these other things but most people don't need any of that stuff. So we tend to recommend something like the Rhythmic or the Power Sound Audio. Mm -hmm. These are not as good looking subs. They're just, you know, ugly black boxes for the most part. <laughs> but who cares? It's a subwoofer. You know, throw it in the corner. Nobody ever looks at it again. And there's also and the they... issue of when you have the cubic volume of air that would yes. actually require this output level. Now, if you have a monster dedicated home theater, right? we might end up there. Uh, but more often than not, the only people asking for that level of output, it's because it's a 10,000 cubic foot great room and it's open to other parts of the house. And when you start talking about if you're actually going to try and play 20 hertz at 115 decibels in an open great room, the rest of the house is going to divorce you. And yes. if they're your children, they're going to, you know, well, seek emancipation. Like <laughs> and, and we've talked about this so many times with people who have open concept rooms and they're like, How do I get reference level bass? I'm like, You don't want it. Yeah. You don't want it. I you mean, even if it. you okay, even if you were the only person living in the house, right. even if that were the case, it would be uncomfortable to be in, number yeah. one. And, and number two, so much crap is the falling amount off the walls. of rattles <laughs> and stuff you would have to track <laughs> down. Like you can't have a piece of crystal in your house like a glass <laughs> that is made of crystal you cannot have it it will vibrate around until it'll find something else to touch and then they'll start rattling believe me i have done it before i have done it on accident some you know and it has happened you do not want it so therefore most of the time we're like yeah well in order to get the base that you want you would need something along the lines of this but you don't really want that so instead get something like the PC 2000, which mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, gets most people where they want to be yeah. and just move it closer to you so you can feel a little bit of the tactile base while it's, it's it's doing its thing. It'll never pressurize the entire space, but you don't want it to anyways. Right. How many times have you heard us say that? So, so why do we recommend him for this guy? He must have a massive room. I well, I mean, we recommend the 4000s because he needed the small footprint. He did have oh, right. a large, uh, fairly large open space, but he wants to get up to those uh, output levels. And we're like, yeah, that's it's a good compromise. You know, it's a good it's a good balance without going ridiculously overboard on either price or size. And it's going to protect itself if you ever do crank it to absolutely insane volumes. And, you know, it just seemed like the right choice. So, yeah, I mean, the combination of things that need to happen for the 16 Ultra to be the right choice they're rare and that's why you don't hear us recommend that particular model very often yeah all right who do we have left oh you got a whole well, bunch of people left don't yeah. even bother we got a whole don't bunch of people bother. left and uh we, we got plans in place to try and catch up in a way so do not worry everyone who has written in we're gonna get to your question uh we've got ideas in mind so yeah there we go yeah. that'll be that for this episode 
All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Matt and Ben to, for going to avrent.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and uh, send us a PayPal donation. And our 131 patrons over at patreon.com, including Carl. Yes, for sure. Matt and Ben, thank you very much for the PayPal donations and patreon.com slash podcast for anyone who would like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Big thanks to our 131 patrons over there. Carl, thank you for being one of them. So thank David for sending me photos to use with AV Gadgets. Scott for sending Rob a donation. Uh, Derek Jr., Nathan, Kurt, Brandon, Billy, Carl, and Matt for uh, sending us notes of gratitude. Yeah, I'll repeat the names. David, thanks for giving Tom permission to use your photos on avgadgets.com. There was another person who gave permission, but that's going to be on the next episode because Mm -hmm. uh, like I described in the beginning, I'm organizing them by weeks just to keep my own head straight because I was starting to come apart at the seams putting this together this morning. Uh, So Scott, thank you very much for the donation that you sent me for our email back and forth. Very nice of you. And then Derek, Jr., Nathan, Kurt, Brandon, Billy, Carl, and Matt. Thank you all very much for the notes of gratitude and uh, encouragement uh, we're back we're back on track so Kurt doesn't have to worry too much and uh, yeah really appreciate those thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions right if you want to get your question answered all you have to do is ask you ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com for AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre, and I'm Rob H now stay in and listen to something Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.